So hello everyone. On behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to welcome you all to the first Human Cell Atlas Latin America Single Cell RNA Seq Data Analysis Workshop. So this is our day four. Um, as we've been sharing with you, this is the second Latin American uh, workshop um, in partnership with the Human Cell Atlas. This one it aims at training. So it is a partnership between researchers from Mexico, Chile, and Brazil this time. Our, both our organizing committee and scientific committee um, includes researchers from these uh, three countries together, from, uh, together with HCA uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, for the second week, we have trainers based in Brazil, Chile, and Mexico and other uh, students and students from other Latin American countries are also joining this uh, second week since it's a virtual uh, workshop. We would like to thank uh, Christine, Tracy, Luke, Samantha and John from the Human Cell Atlas. They've been with us since the beginning of the uh, organizing time for this uh, workshop. Uh, here we would also like to thank the organizations from uh, the organizing uh, committee and the scientific committee and the institutions that supported us financially. Our workshop today uh, looks like this. So we will start uh, right now with the first uh, morning session. We have two morning sessions followed by a 45 minute break before the afternoon sessions. And then a half an hour break between project design discussions with those that were selected for the second week. Be aware of the of your time zone. And after these two first sessions before the break, we uh, request that you guys log off and log in again uh, at 2 p.m. So with this, I would like to uh, introduce you guys to our first uh, speaker. So Dr. Nathan Lewis, he was a postdoctoral fellow uh, from Harvard Medical School. He holds a PhD in bioengineering from the University of California. Nathan is currently an associate professor at the Department of Pediatrics and Bioengineering at the University of California. In his lab, he uses systems biology approaches to make sense of complex pathways governing cell phenotypes. Uh, to develop network-based diagnostics for childhood disorders and to understand the regulation and activity of complex pathways, such as metabolism. Insights are also used to guide synthetic uh, biology efforts to engineer mammalian cells for biotherapeutic purposes. So welcome, Professor Nater. We'll be paying attention to you now. Yep, so thank you so much for this opportunity for us to present some of our work. Uh, looks like I, I need to, I think you got the presenter view, right? Let me try that again. Okay, are you seeing my presenter view or my, um, or the correct view yes. of the, okay. Yeah, for the correct reason. view, yeah, correct You're view. seeing the correct view? Okay. Yeah. For some reason it's highlighting in the wrong screen. <laughs> okay. So as long as you don't see my cheat sheet. <laughs> so thank you so much for, for allowing me to um, present some of our work. As you mentioned, I, I'm a systems biologist, um, but I was originally trained as a biochemist. And so every time I think about, um, about these complex systems that make up our living cells and so forth, I wanna bring it back to the individual proteins and molecules mediating those interactions. And so we've been able to start taking this sort of approach to make sense of to make sense of um, of the complex communication going between cells. And so we've been thinking about this in a way. Well, how do we how do we interrogate this? How do we wiretap these cells? So. Um, one thing to think about for, first is what does a cell even look like in its native in its native state? Well, oftentimes we think about a cell and we draw cells like this, where they're just alone. They're not doing anything. You give them some inputs and they do, they, maybe they grow or something like that. But we oftentimes think, we don't really think about their entire context that they're found in. 
But cell-cell interactions, this communication between cells defines everything we do, everything we see in the macroscopic view of life. Um, so for example, within an individual muscle, as you're running, you have interactions between cells, you have um, communication between cells that tell your cell, your, your muscle fibers to contract or extend. Um, you have um, interactions between cells um, in many different contexts. Throughout development and cell differentiation, you have communication between cells that tell the cells which lineages to, to, uh, to form and so forth. Every single tissue and organ is a complex mixture of cells that are interacting with each other, telling each other what to do and div dividing up the, um, the many processes that need to be done to make the whole organism live. You have your immune system, for example, also is gonna, there's gonna be massive communication where certain cells will recognize something that is non-self and then respond to say, well, we got a mountain attack against this. And so cell-cell interactions are critical to every aspect of our life and perturbations to these cell interactions underlie most diseases. It's, it's hard to figure out to find a disease that does not involve some level of cell-cell communication. Now the question is, how is this communication mediated? Well, it's mediated at several levels. You can have individual cells physically contacting with each other where the proteins or macromolecules um, on the surface of the proteins are interacting, thus relaying signals through signaling pathways to change the gene expression patterns or the, or the, uh, um, the uh, uh, um, structure of the cell. And so this is a very, this is a very, uh, this is just one type of, of interaction. We also have um, cases where cells will secrete signals to each other, where you'll have a, a secreted protein or molecule be sent to one cell to stimulate some responses, but to receive that signal, you have to have receptors in, or um, to, to, uh, to relay that signal. And then you have extracellular matrix and receptor interaction. Sometimes there's this extracellular matrix, this uh, microenvironment around the cell that's going to be mediating some of this communication. And so there's multiple types of communication. There's also um, autocrine signaling um, where, a, where a cell will tell itself something to drive it down a certain uh, fate or, or a phenotype. And so Eric Armengol, an outstanding uh, PhD student in my lab, um, when he approached my group, he started asking these questions. Can we decipher these, these signals? Or rather, can we listen into all these complex signals going on to figure out, to basically tap the communication between these cells? And so um, we went through and dug through the literature to figure out, well, what are the best ways to do this? What are the different techniques? And gene expression data um, is ubiquitous and quite powerful for being able to tease apart the signals. There's a number of labs out there that have developed powerful tools and technologies to, um, to be able to decipher the cell-cell communication um, based off of gene expression data and other types. So basically what you end up doing to be able to do this, you'll collect your, your uh, transcriptomic data and then uh, process it so you have all your different gene expression levels for each sample. And then you can bring in information from decades and decades of, of, of research where people have identified which um, ligands bind to which receptors. And this gives you a basis, basically um, the connections between cells. Um, in, in general. But if you can take this transcriptomic data and this information on the ligand receptor pairs, you can merge this together to start to figure out which cells are talking to whom and what are the signals being passed. And so with this, once you have a matrix of the ligand receptor pairs, you can go in and score the, the samples to see when do you have um, ligand A um, interacting, most likely interacting with the ligand B, which cells are, meet, are, are doing that. So you can score the co-expression more or less of 
those ligands and receptors using a number of different scoring functions to figure out how likely is that ligand receptor pair mediating the communication and which cells are, are uh, communicating. And then you can aggregate this information to, to narrow down really which cells are interacting with, with which. And so a key part of, of this is also uh, visualization of, these, of this information. And so there's a number of tools out there and, and approaches that have been developed to visualize these cell-cell interactions as they are um, inferred from transcriptomic data. So for example, you might have a case where you have transcriptomic data from two cell types, cell type A and cell type B. And for the ligands and receptors, you'll have gene expression levels um, that you will measure. You can take this now and overlay it onto information that you have about the ligand receptor pairs. And there's a few different ways that you can quantify this uh, communication. One of the techniques is called expression thresholding. So basically what you're doing with this is that you have a certain point where you say, where you determine that a gene is either expressed or not expressed. And as you can see right here, um, um, the idea here is if a, if a ligand is, is expressed and a receptor is expressed, you say, okay, there's possibly communication going on between, between those two cell types. Um, and so this can be used on bulk data or single cell data and is quite easy to use and is used quite extensively because you're basically just doing binary calls of whether or not a gene is expressed or not. And that leads to a binary um, call on whether there's a communication going on. Now, this is just to be done with care also though, because not all ligands are needed at a certain threshold. Sometimes a ligand, ligand actually will be active at a much lower level. Same thing with a receptor. Maybe a receptor needs to be very highly expressed to be active, or maybe it can be really low. And so it is, it is generally um, a, um, suggested that if you're going to be using expression thresholding to determine communication, you should probably figure out what the gene specific threshold should be as opposed to a general threshold for expression levels. And that can be done, for example, by looking across many different cell types, many different tissues, and can be inferred using a few techniques that have been published. Um, but that's the most basic and but most widely used approach for measuring communication between cells. You can also do something called expression product, where you don't draw a threshold, but you just multiply the, um, the uh, ligand expression level and the receptor expression level. That way, um, you can still have um, um, estimates of communication or, or predictions of communication, even if you have lower expression. Um, and so at that point, after you've gone through and computed these ligand receptor pairs by multiplying their expression levels, you can rank order the, the scores for each ligand receptor pair and determine which ones are most likely to be the dominant uh, communi modes of communication. There's also expression correlation where you look across a number of different samples um, and, and in each sample you have a different ligand and receptor expression level. And so you can see under certain uh, conditions when you have them both very highly expressed, that would be cases where you have, where you're more confident that there's communication. You can look to see across certain given cell types as the cell types increase or decrease in abundance, whether or not the ligand receptor pairs are, are correlating. And that was, that's a way to, to estimate communication. You also have differential co combinations where you're looking at the fold change between the ligand and, and receptor samples. And the, again, this, will gonna be, this is gonna be um, binary. You can say under certain conditions that, this, that a given ligand is upregulated and a given receptor is, is upregulated, that would, then you would say that, um, that there would be communication going on between those cell types. So these are just four categories of ways to measure communication between cells. There's actually a number of even more advanced approaches that have been published um, that can be used. And so um, I would do recommend if you want to understand how to do this, going to Eric Armengal's uh, Nature Reviews Genetics paper that came out at the beginning of this year, um, where they go, where he goes in and describes the 
um, the details of uh, a number of different techniques. And to benefit, I mean, to help you out, there's a number of great tools that have been published that allow you to, to, to do this um, quantification of cell-cell communication um, from transcriptomic data or other types of data. Um, so with these tools, the big question comes um, down, what comes down to what sort of communication um, do we want to try to understand? Um, and uh, whether it's gonna be just understanding who's near who or what are they saying to each other? So first, the question we, we wanted to understand if we could use some of these techniques to infer where the conversation is taking place between cells. In other words, which cells are next to each other, whispering in each other's ears. Um, and can we use this information from cell cell communication to infer the structure of, a cell, of, of an organism? So this is a T SNE plot, plot taken from a science paper, um, a really elegant study. Um, and as you look at this, you can immediately tell what, or, what the organism looks like, right? Um, well, not really, because basically our, you know, when we're analyzing single cell data, um, we don't really have any information about the structure of the organism. What we're doing is we're looking at similarities between the gene expression states. And so um, this sort of analysis, uh, single cell analyses, by and large, don't allow us to actually know what the structure of the organism is. So this actually is C. elegans. Now, what does C. elegans really look like? It looks like that. Um, you have roughly a thousand different gene, uh, cells that are reproducibly located um, in, in the worm. And each one of them has their own gene expression state and they're gonna be communicating with, with their neighbors and other cells. And so we were wondering, can we take this, um, kind of a mess of, of ex gene expression data, as great as the data is, can we take it and figure out the structure of the worm? And not only figure out the structure of the worm, but figure out what are the uh, key components that define that structure. So we were able to use uh, transcript uh, single cell transcriptomic data that was measured across many different cell types in C. elegans. Um, and uh, um, ranging from the body wall muscle down to germline um, and many other different cell types. And so what, we, what you can do on this is you can take for every single cell type, you can measure for all the different genes, the expression level of, of that. And so we got this matrix and wanted to analyze it. Now, one thing that we need that I mentioned that we need to be able to infer cell-cell interactions is there is a need to, to actually understand what the ligand receptor pairs that might be involved are. And unfortunately, there wasn't any really, really good curated, expansive uh, um, database of ligand receptor pairs for C. elegans. And so we had to build that. And so um, what we ended up doing is we took the human ligand receptor pairs, um, uh, a database of human uh, ligand receptor pairs that, we that was compiled by Eric, and then align those to C. elegans genes to be able to estimate, well, which ligands and which receptors are in C. elegans and making the assumptions that, that these ligand receptor pairs are gonna be more or less consistent, um, or at least uh, um, um, retained through evolution. And this gave us a, um, a database of, of, of C. elegans ligand receptor pairs that are, um, estimated based off the human ligand receptor pairs. And so with this, um, we were then able to bring in additional data and uh, then further manually curate it to be able to develop this um, well curated um, uh, database of 245 um, ligand receptor pairs that we are highly confident are actually do exist in C. elegans. And so using this, this set of um, ligand receptor pairs and the single cell transcriptomic data, we were able to then um, use the expression thresholding technique to um, estimate the, 
the ligands and receptors um, interacting for each cell, for each pair of cells. And so with this, um, we were then able to take all of these um, ligand receptor interactions for, for, um, for each pair of cells and aggregate those to make it um, to quantify the likelihood that two cells are interacting, or rather the strength of their interactions. And so when we look at these cell-cell interaction scores for all pairs of cell types, um, you can see that some of them um, interact quite highly, which is shown in dark blue, and some of them show very weak interactions shown by white. And as you can see here, germline cells are in general not really interacting with anybody else. And that's in part because these, these cells are actually insulated um, to, uh, uh, from, the rest of the, from the rest of the worm. Now, we, we, another one we see are the neurons. Now, the neurons themselves actually showed some of the highest interaction scores, which is consistent with the fact that these neurons are, inter are, um, are interacting with each other to, um, um, as part of the, the um, nervous system of the worm. And so with this, we, we, it was really uh, uh, made us really confident that, that yes, you can actually take the single cell data and get some information about which cells are interacting with each other. Um, and so Eric also developed to, um, um, a, a tool to enable the calculation and quantification of these cell-cell interactions and identifying and identify the uh, ligand receptor pairs underlying those. Um, this tell this um, and and uh, this is publicly available, but his tool called Cell to Cell um, has a number of different features and 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 approaches in there, and it's all outlined in a way that where you can show it to where you can load your data, um, you can plot the interactions between cells, and you can do all sorts of other different visuals to identify ligand receptor pairs that are involved, and um, and correlate these with. Uh, with, uh, with various phenotypic features. So this ends up being a powerful toolbox that can be used to take any given trans trans single cell transcriptomic data set and start to infer cell-cell interactions. Let's see. So now, what, now going back to the original question, we were wondering, not only can we, I mean, now that we've established that we can identify um, actual cell-cell interactions or likely cell-cell interactions, um, the big question is, can we figure out this, this structure of the worm? Now, what we would actually expect would be for you to have the highest interaction strength for cells that are most proximal to each other. Um, and so, how do we do that? How do we know what the structure is, or do we even know what the structure of the worm is? And the answer is yes. People have gone through and done to great lengths to figure out what are all the thousand, roughly thousand cells in, a, in C. elegans and where are they located? In fact, there was this great database published um, a number, uh, about 10 years ago, 10, 11 years ago, where they went in and actually measured all of the nuclei and placed all of the nuclei, gave, basically gave it a, um, coordinates in the worm. And so um, with this, this allows us to, um, to compute the distance between cells where you can have different cell types are going to be located in different regions of the worm, whether it be neurons, intestine, um, uh, hypodermal rectal cells, and so forth. And so with this, we were able to then go back with the transcriptomic data and connect the, um, the individual uh, single cell RNA-seq data, se data sets um, to cells in specific locations. And so with this, we then were able to compute the, the um, difference, be the distance between cell types using this technique where we just look at the pairwise Euclidean distance. So be between any given cell types, you find the um, minimum distance between the cell types. Um, and so you can see, so we can be able to quantify for any given cell type, um, how far is it from each other cell type? And this, so this gives us a uh, an assessment of 
of physical different distance between cell types that we can then compare to our cell-cell interactions. And so that's what we did is we looked at the, at the um, physical distance between cell types and compared that to the cell-cell interaction distances, or rather how strong the cell-cell interactions between or between the, the different cell types. And went through, we looked at the correlation between these, uh, these metrics and it was, it was significantly negative. Um, going back again to this idea that um, the stronger the interactions, the, uh, the smaller the, um, the distance, okay? Um, but a, a Spearman correlation of, of negative 0.21 is not a strong correlation. Now, what we were thinking about this is that there are a number of cell ligand receptor pairs that are communication oriented and not structural oriented. There's gonna be a subset of, of interactions that are covering the physical interactions and so forth. And so we wanted to, to figure out what are those subsets and, and can we actually identify the core set of ligand receptor pairs that define um, organism structure. So what, what we did was we used an optimization algorithm, we used a genetic algorithm to identify the sets of ligand receptor pairs that would lead to the um, most accurate worm structure, physical structure. And so the way this works is that you'll take an initial pair set of ligand receptor pairs, and then you will basically modify or modify which ligand receptor pairs and so forth were being in, um, introduced or being accounted for and then do a, uh, a, a test where you see how close is the is the actual physical distance between cells to the cell cell interaction score distance and then you can iteratively go through this and modify that over and over again until you converge upon optimal pairs of ligand receptor or optimal, optimal ligand receptor pairs that, that um, best define the structure. So this is a little bit what it looks like right here. You start with the 250 uh, ligand receptor pairs, you randomly select pairs um, and you obtain the cell cell interaction matrices. Then you compare those to the Euclidean distances, the physical distances between the cell types to get a score, basically to quantify the, uh, the correlation between your, your CCI matrix and the Euclidean distance. And then you select those that gave you the best score shown by those two values right there. And then mix and match the, uh, the, um, the ligand receptor pairs that are included in that. Um, randomly put in a few back and then run this run through this again. You do this over and over again. And what you'll see is over time, you'll converge upon on an optimal set of, or one of many optimal sets of, um, of ligand receptor pairs that give you the best matching between the cell-cell interaction matrix and the Euclidean distance. And so what, that's exactly what we saw was over, over a, just a few iterations, we managed to get uh, a actually quite strong um, uh, Spearman correlation. Um, and so after we did this for several several rounds, we would and we'd see it converge. We would select we would take the ligand receptor pair set and as as a candidate. Now we did this um, many 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 times because genetic algorithms, as with many similar algorithms do not always converge on the um, optimal solution, but they, they converge on a solution that's good enough. And so when you run it over and over again, you may get a different answer. And so we looked at the independent uh, genetic algorithm runs and looked to see which ligand receptor pairs are being included. And you can see the, even though there was some differences across the runs, there was a, lo a lot of the ligand receptor pairs that were in, in a single run were actually found in many runs. So it suggested that we weren't just catching random sets of ligand receptor pairs, but we were we had identified um, a core set that um, that could that contribute to. It. In fact, 
if you look at all of these, you run the correlation between all the all the ligand receptor pairs, you can find a subset of them that that um, routinely um, were found in the uh, GA uh, stimulations uh, runs. And so these were the ones that showed the highest co-occurrence and the ones that we felt like were most important for predicting the animal structure, the, the physical structure of the, uh, of the animals. So um, what we looked at when you go in and you look at the um, individual um, pathways that were represented in these pairs, we saw a number of, of, um, of cellular functions and pathways that are, that are associated with cell patterning, morphogenesis, and tissue maintenance. Um, so this includes, as you can see right here, we have quite a few around cell migration, some around when signaling, cell adhesion is quite important. Um, and so you can see that the ligand receptor pairs, they make sense. The ones that are critical for the physical structure of the worm, they make sense. Um, so um, what you end up seeing right here is while we started with a spearman correlation of negative 0.21, looking at all ligand receptor pairs, and this is another way to show it where when you look at the individual clusters of cells, um, these are colored by the sender cells. These are gonna be, these sender cells are gonna be communicating with a number of other cells. Sometimes uh, um, there's many different cell types communicating with, um, with a single cell type. Sometimes you have a single cell type that's being, um, that's being mostly communicated through, uh, through a specific cell type. Now, when we go in and we use this genetic algorithm to identify the most important ligand receptor pairs for physical structure, we ended up getting a much stronger Pearson's correlation, uh, sorry, Spearman correlation of negative 0.63 being defined by 37 ligand receptor pairs. And when you look at the individual cell types, um, you are seeing, for example, the pharyngeal cells are closer to each other when you account for this. Um, you can see um, uh, the neurons are even closer to each other and interacting with each other. Um, and they're also interacting with the body and the, oh, and the intestinal muscles. So this gave us some confidence. We wanted to look a little bit more into it to see, to actually look at it in the context of, uh, of the known structure itself. So what we did is we took the C. elegans body and divided it into uh, into various sections based on where on um, whether it's anterior or posterior um, sides of it. And so with that, we were able to compute all pairwise interactions between the, um, the all of the uh, between all of the cells in each of the bins and compute which ones are gonna be actually in each, each, each bin. So what you can see here is, here we have divided the, um, the worm into, the, into three different sections, and you can see where the different cell types where, are located and what are the ligand receptor pairs, um, where are they uh, mostly functional. So what you can see here, for example, whoops, I just jumped to the end. Um, let me go back. Okay, so what you can see here, a little too far. Okay. Okay, here we go. So what we found here is that there are certain lig ligand receptor pairs that are important for different regions of the worm. And so these actually do make quite a bit of sense. For example, LIN44 is known to be enriched um, in the tail, um, while um, many other ligand receptor pairs are, are, are critical to other regions. So, um, so in summary, with that, we were able to, to identify from this a number of ligand receptor pairs that are mediating interactions between individual cell types and um, and can be used to define the uh, the organization of an organism. So you could imagine you could start trying to scale this up to to higher organisms to really figure out, given single cell data, can you figure out um, 
maybe the order, the structure of individual tissues and so forth. And so that's that's just one type of information that we can derive from from single cell data to gain insights into into cell cell interactions. But what we wanted to do is now tap more into the conversations. What are the cells saying to each other? How are they deriving each other's uh, phenotypes? And um, which of those conversations are, are critical to that? Now, in doing this, or as I mentioned, there's a number of powerful tools out there for taking transcriptomic data and, um, and inferring cell-cell communication. There's a challenge though, is that a number of the tools out there, they don't really account for the cell's context. What you typically do is you'll take your two samples and you'll compare and you'll look at the differences between those, those, those uh, samples. And it will tell you, for example, which ligand receptor pairs differ between them, the two, or which cell types are, are interacting. But they are not able to, they're not really equipped to handle the diversity of, of data types nor temporal aspects of cell cell interactions. Um, and so, for example, you can have, you can have, you could have samples from different stages of life where cell cell interactions are going to be um, changing thus leading to, um, leading to um, phenotypes of aging. And the current tools out there can't allow you to simultaneously analyze all of those samples to identify which cell types are, which cell-cell interactions drive this, this, uh, these aging phenotypes, and what are the ligand receptor pairs that are, that are mediating that. Also, disease states. If you have multiple different stages of a disease, it's it's difficult to identify to leverage all the information you have inherently um, in there that would asso be associated with different states of the disease, or cellular localization and so forth. And so, what we need there is a tool that will allow us to simultaneously analyze all of these different data types that allow you to account for not only the cell types and 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 ligand receptor pairs, but also Different times, or different, or different uh, tissues, or different um, subjects, and so forth. So it's a multi-dimensional problem. Now, for multi-dimensional pr problems, uh, tensor factorization can be quite powerful. So Eric was thinking about this, and he thought, well, maybe what we could do is develop an an n-dimensional tensor that counts for all these interactions that allow us to analyze all of these simultaneously. Now, to, to simplify this first, what you have for a given sample, you would have uh, and a given sample and for a specific ligand receptor pair, let's just take, for example, ligand receptor pair one, you would have um, your cells and tissue or the cells in your single cell data set um, uh, mapped out so that you could have for a given, for, a given um, for all of your cells, you'd have certain receiver cells, certain sender cells, for that ligand receptor pair, you could quantify how strong the communication score is between those cells. And that would be the first dimension or the first two dimensions of your, of your matrix. Um, but we wanna know more about that. We wanna, we wanna be able to test all the ligand receptor pairs. And so you can start to stack these together into a three-dimensional uh, communication tensor um, for one sample. And so, for that sample, you will have all of your sender, uh, sender and receiver uh, cells. And then you would have in the next dimension, the scores for each subsequent ligand receptor pair. And so this again is a little more complex for analysis, but it's, a, but it's doable. But oftentimes you're not just analyzing one sample, you're analyzing multiple samples, whether it be from different subjects or different time points and so forth. And so what you can end up doing now is you can generate these three-dimensional tensors for each sample and start to co connect them into a, a four-dimensional communi uh, uh, communication tensor. And while our minds cannot really analyze that many dimensions at once, computers fortunately can. And so there's some great techniques in, um, in tensor factorization, uh, um, ten uh, uh, tensor component analysis, where you could, where you can uh, decompose these this tensor into various factors and identify 
from those factors, um, what are the patterns across your samples that would that that uh, what are the what are the uh, dominant patterns across your samples that you'd see? And then under underlying that pattern, what are the ligand receptor pairs involved? And which cells are involved, both sender and receiver cells, in that pattern? So you can see, for example, if these samples were time points, you can say over this over your samples, samples you'll have a decreasing um, influence over time uh, of this of these ligand receptor pairs involving these sender and these receiver cells, and so it allows you to to identify all the dominant communication features in that large data set. Just to give you a little idea of how, how it works, we first did a simulation of this where we took three cell populations and simulated um, the um, ligand receptor interactions between these cell types where these are happening at different magnitudes with for each, for each time point. So with this, what we had to do is we identified all the ligand receptor pairs that were going to be um, involved between these different cell populations. We defined the which cell types were interacting with which. And then we merged those to identify, to look at patterns to where we mapped out individual patterns for sets of the ligand receptor pairs that guide, that influence the interaction between different cell populations. So we actually had a few different patterns that we simulated where we had, for example, um, uh, some cells that were interacting where the ligand receptor pairs were changing in this sort of fashion. We had others where the ligand receptor pairs were interacting and were mediating it in this sort of way. We have this impulse. We have these, this uh, distribution where, where there was an initial um, large amount of interaction between those cell types with those ligand receptor pairs and it die down. And then we had kind of a steady decrease. So we, so we built this, this large tensor where we simulated, made the simulation for these different cell populations with different uh, um, ligand receptor pairs following these patterns and asked ourselves, can we use this tensor decomposition to reconstruct these patterns and identify correctly which ligand receptor pairs we assigned to it and which cells were interacting. So when we did the decomposition, we actually found that the um, that the best the best number of factors, the number of signals that are in our simulation would be four, which would which was exactly what we actually put in. So we were excited to see that that it was able to get the right number of patterns. And then from there, what we found was the samples actually followed the patterns that we put in where we had the first factor had this, this uh, not quite a sawtooth, but this uh, oscillatory um, uh, pattern. And the, but not only did it recapitulate that this was a major pattern in our data set, but it said, these are the ligand receptor pairs that followed that pattern. And these were the cells that were involved. We had cell A was interacting through, this, with, through these ligand receptor pairs with this pattern with cell C. And same thing we found for, we, we, we found the next factor actually was our, our second pattern where we accurately were able to capture the ligand receptor pairs that we had put into the simulation and the cell interactions and so forth. So each of the factors correctly recapitulated the actual cell-cell interactions and the ligand receptor pairs involved. So this made us happy that it was able to do it on this toy model. So we decided to, to throw it out a real data set. And that is something that unfortunately many of us have, um, have had to deal with this past year is, um, is um, COVID-19. Now COVID-19 we know has in the process, a subset of, of subjects of people will get severe COVID-19 where there's a major immune response that, um, that can lead to to um, major illness or even death. And so there was a single cell RNA-seq data set where they took bronchial lavage fluid, oops, um, yeah. they took bron bronchial lavage fluid from the lungs of three healthy patients, three mild patients, and three and six severe patients. And, um, and did full single cell RNA-seq on them to figure out 
um, to, in, in an effort to be able to explore um, what, what, what's going on in the lungs. Why, why do some people have severe COVID-19 and others don't? And so what we did is we took this data and we defined, we built this 40 communication um, uh, tensor um, where we had 106, uh, 189 ligand receptor pairs that were, that were included, including multimeric complexes. We used si the six different cell types um, or you use six different cell types in senders and receivers based off of the original data set for the cell types that were dominant in it. And then we looked across all the samples, the healthy people, the, those with mild COVID-19 and those with severe COVID-19 and built this four-dimensional uh, communication tensor to be able to see which cells were communicating which cells and which ligand receptor pairs were involved. And the fact that we have all these different samples all at the same time means we can start to draw correlations between the, um, the COVID-19 outcome with these subjects and connect those to the cells types, the this, cell-cell this, um, interactions and the ligand receptor pairs mediating that. And so when we did the uh, initial um, decomposition, we found that the, uh, we did the elbow analysis where you could see where we got the best amount, the most, um, um, uh, signal um, where the optimal uh, number of factors would be about 10. And so these were the 10 factors. Now, this is a lot of information on one slide, so I'll walk you through some of it. But basically what we have here is we have 10 factors where each of the factors has a certain, is, is associated with, a, so, um, with the different weights, the different loadings for each diff for different samples. Um, so, for example, factor one right here has low loadings for the for the um, healthy controls, and higher loadings for the mild and severe COVID nineteen. And then for that factor, we have a number of ligand receptor pairs that that were important to that factor, and the cell types that were involved. So, I'm going to walk you through a few of these examples. So, first, we found that um, interactions with the epithelial cells defined. Um, the, uh, the factors that correlated, that show a strong correlation with severity. So for example, right here, these, uh, this, this was exciting because, because um, while we did see this correlation with these two factors and it was very significant and it was significant, they were biologically significant in the sense that a study actually demonstrated that, that um, the COVID-19 severity actually uh, is, is, is driven in part by the the um, interactions between the epithelial cells and the immune system. Um, and so we found that this, even though this was from a different data set, we were able to, to recapitulate um, what, is, what is known with these two factors. So, but it's not only knowing who, which cells are talking to whom, we, want, we were able to identify what are the key factors that are involved in this. And so, um, very briefly, um, in factor one, we found that there was this, um, inter this involvement with MDK, for example, that has been known to um, exacerbate leukocyte recruitment to inflammation sites and has been um, also been shown to be um, um, involved in the response to mechanical stress on lung epithelial cells. So that was exciting to see that. Um, we also saw um, several other uh, factors. Um, interactions that were important um, in, for example, inflammation in the central nervous system and um, uh, um, um, actually there was that, that was one was actually found in a science paper that was published a week or two ago. And so we were able to recapitulate that too. So that was exciting to see that we were, that we were able to find cell-cell interactions that correlated with severity um, and, the, and the ligand receptor pairs driving that. Now we were not only did we look at correlations, but we were able to identify signatures of severe cases and, and signatures of mild cases on their own. So we found, for example, in factor eight, this was mostly driven by severe cases right here. And so we were able to then look at the ligand receptor pairs and the um, sender receiver cells. Now something that, was, that we point out here is, is that we found that macrophages were very much involved um, were very critical to the um, to the severe cases, 
And this is actually known that they, that that um, that they that macrophages are playing can play a major uh, role as pro-inflammatory sander cells. Um, and with this, we were able to identify a number of different uh, uh, ligand receptor pairs that were involved. And these are known. Um, several of these are known to be involved and are actually have been suggested to be pharmacological um, targets to suppress uh, immune hyperactivation in COVID-19. But that's for severe. We also had mild um, COVID-19. So again, factor eight was severe. Factor three is mostly mild. And we again found macrophages were involved here, but they were inv involved in a different way. They had a, um, a different set of, of ligand receptor pairs that are actually more associated with anti-inflammatory responses. So while it seemed like severe cases were going, um, the macrophages were going more to an M1 state, which leads to very, a very pro-inflammatory state, the mild subjects were able to fight against this. And we saw instead this factors uh, three and 10 which showed ligand receptor pairs that were involved in anti-inflammatory responses. So we can see right here, using this tensor decomposition, we're able to, to tease apart the, even the anti-inflammatory versus pro-inflammatory responses of macrophages in COVID-19. And so we also found that in, in healthy conditions, you, they were basically in a homeostatic um, state where, you could, where we were able to see um, um, ligand receptor pairs that were um, involved in many different cell types. And the interesting thing here is the center receiver cells were pretty much uniform. In fact, you can quantify this using the Gini coefficient. And sure enough, we found that these are pretty stable. And the way we interpret this is that in healthy conditions, you basically just have the subject's baseline immune system, which will vary across subjects. And so you don't see a strong correlation because you're not really correlating it with the, um, with the major assault, whereas um, COVID-19 is a major you know, um, consistent assault against uh, that is uniform across people. Um, and we were able to identify a number of interactions that, were, that, that are important for uh, promoting, fighting against tissue in, uh, injury and promoting tissue repair and so forth. Uh, so that was nice to see. And there's a number of different immune responses. You can dig through these and identify more immune responses, for example, between B cells and other immune cell types or between um, T cells and natural killer cells. And you can dig through these a little bit more. I won't go into the details for the sake of time, but in summary, we can tap cell-cell interactions. These are gonna be fundamental to life as we know it. And we can be able to predict these interactions using transcriptomic data, such as single cell RNA-seq. And so, um, and there's a lot of great tools out there to do this. Now we showed that we can use this to look at the location of the, uh, of the cells involved in the interactions and be able to identify the core ligand receptor pairs that, are, that determine tissue structure. And we also demonstrated that um, these cell-cell interactions can, and their ligand receptor pairs can be identified, especially the ones that are driving phenotypes, whether it be severe COVID-19 or other diseases. And so there's a number of, uh, of, of other applications that, that we're applying this to, and, um, and even more that can be applied to in general. Now this work was done in large part, and Eric Armengal has been an outstanding graduate student in my lab. Um, he's a, a, a Fulbright fellow and, and, and part of the Kona Seed program in Chile. And so he's been, it's been a real blessing having him in my lab. He brought in a lot of these ideas around cell-cell interactions and, um, and um, has been developing some great tools. So if you have questions about, about how to do this, you definitely wanna reach out to him and uh, try out his tool cell to cell. But our work has been funded in my lab um, by a number of different, um, a number of different companies, uh, government agencies and private foundations. And a lot of this work was done in collaboration with Eileen O'Rourke's lab on the C. elegans work in um, uh, University of Virginia, Arlington and then um, with other collaborators at UCSD, such as Olivier harris Mendy's group, um, who helped us with the uh, review at the beginning. So I'll be happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you, Professor Nathan, for such an amazing presentation. It was uh, really great to hear, uh, specifically also about your new results that you just shared today.
uh, really great. We have quite a few questions from the audience, so we're going to go with those. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the first one from Marco Petri. Hi, Nathan. Is there a way to weight in receptors that have more than one uh, ligand, possibly with different implications? He gives an example, B7 molecule binding to CD28 and RPDL1. If yes, do you know if this is considered a cell uh, is considered in cell phone and other tools? So this can actually be done in our tools. Um, uh, Eric would need to chime in whether it can be done in the other ones, but we can it can definitely be considered. Basically, it ends up just being an additional an additional interaction that's that's uh, that's tested. Yes. Uh, great. Uh, next one is the correlation between RNA and protein expression of the receptors and ligands known and incorporated into the interaction models. This could lead to a high rate of false discoveries. If not, mm -hmm. is there any way to estimate and incorporate the effects of false transcriptional regulation on the cell cell interactions constructed using RNA seq data? That's an awesome a a question. And I think that it's an area for, for further research. We do know that the correlation between transcript and protein is weak. Um, and a lot of it has to, comes down to transcript specific uh, regulation of, of, its, uh, of, of how it's process, how each transcript is processed and ultimately translated. Um, and differences in also in, uh, in degradation rates of proteins and so forth. So there's a number of, of challenges there. Um, and so we make an assumption that there is a correlation. And so that actually is, is a weakness with, with all tools out there. But I think that it would be an awesome idea to actually go in and if you can go in and you can train this relationship between mRNA and protein, then you could, and you bring that transform into this, into these tools. I think you would actually, um, you, could, you have the possibility of getting a higher, um, uh, or decreasing the false positive rate and enriching the sample. So definitely, if, if, uh, if nobody's done that, which I haven't seen, um, I think that would be a great research project. Great. So uh, next one from Luis Gerardo Fernandez. How would you measure the interaction between ligands and intracellular receptors? Or this, uh, this model, does this model work for any kind of ligand receptor interaction? So it should act. Uh, it should work for any ligand receptor because you're not you're not modeling the the um, the anything about the, the uh, localization. You're just looking at do you know if this ligand receptor pair, or ligand receptor pair interacts, and so um, so yes, you can actually just incorporate those intracellular receptors too. Well, so uh, from Tiago Lubiana Alves, great talk. In C. elegans, will there be a way to identify the interactions between each of the thousand cells beyond just the cell types? Can you identify each of the thousand cells in single cell RNA seq data? I think that's still a challenge. That's, that's that the that the community is trying to do. Um, they're trying to increase the resolution. Um, it comes down to the, the biggest challenge is going from the single cell RNA seq and being able to to take every single cell and say this is this cell type. Whereas right now the current algorithms are you're basically clustering um, the, the individual cell types and some if the cell types are too close to each other they fall into the same cluster so that's the biggest challenge. So if we can develop a way like sorry for example, um, sorting all the cells, having someone with a very fine razor blade cut out every cell and and do the transcriptional profiling on that, then you'd be able to. But I think that we're still working on the technological aspect of being able to to more powerfully identify cell types in single cell data. Perfect. Uh, from Alberto Salazar Granara, uh, this type of measurements between ligand and receptors, do, can they influence in redefining orthosteric and allosteric sites? That's a good question. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that these, that these proteins can interact and um, and I think it would be interesting to go back and, and analyze a number of, of different data types or, or, and, or rather uh, samples in different contexts to see if these interactions differ. But I think you'd have to bring in a, some, some, some detailed biochemistry into, into, the, into the picture. So uh, there's definitely a lot of work that can be done in that space. Luckily, you do like biochemistry a lot. 
I, I used to like it. I, I went computational because I got tired of doing Western blots. <laughs> <laughs> right. But so I think that the, it's, it's, it's a, it, but the, like, we definitely need the, that hard biochemistry to keep being done. Um, and in, in addition to all this great, exciting uh, single cell. Right. In, in the end, in the, yeah, in the end, you always need that, right, to, to yes. validate and to keep on going. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. Another one from Lucas Pires Garcia Oliveira. Do you think it, it, it is feasible to use such approach on flow cytometry data? Yes, you could use this on flow cytometry data. Um, uh, that actually helps you to decrease some of the uh, some of the challenges that we face with with um, single cell RNA seq because then you could actually have pools of flow sorted bulk data. So yes, that would work. From Danielle Palma, why do you uh, why did you choose minimal distance instead, uh, for example, the average? I mean that's a good question. Um, some of these cells are going to be are going to be very long, and and so if you take the average, you're actually going to miss the contacts between a, sh a short cell and a long cell. So that's why we chose the minimal. Well, Professor Nathan, thank you so much for uh, being here and for taking the time to answer all these uh, questions from from the audience. It's no been problem. a pleasure. We're gonna have a follow up with Eric. Mm -hmm. So, thank you so much. Thank you. Looking thank you forward so to having another opportunity with you. Yeah. Thank you. You take care. Thank you. Thanks, Nate, for the presentation. <laughs> I think I think that uh, Nathan already introduced Eric in his talk, right? But Eric is a new, already dear colleague for us. He's been very much involved with this workshop and working very hard with the other trainers for the second week uh, part of this um, uh, of this event. Uh, so uh, just a short introduction for Eric. We already know how great he is. But Eric graduated from Universidad de Chile as an engineer in molecular biotechnology in 2015. In 2018, he started as a PhD student in bioinformatics and systems biology at the University of California, San Diego, and joined the lab of Dr. Nathan Muse in uh, 2019. Since then, he has been using single cell transcriptomics for studying cell-cell interactions and developing new computational methods for inferring intracellular interactions. It's great to have you here with us, Eric. Please. So thank you for the invitation for this workshop. Uh, I'm really happy to participate in this, given that it's intended for people in Latin America. Um, let me start sharing the screen. Okay, can you see my, my slides? Yes. Okay. So as I was saying, um, it's great to participate in this workshop and try to show new ways to analyze single cell data sets. Um, studying cell cell communication and interaction is a very new field, especially using single cell data. So most of what Nate showed before is like different ways to interpret uh, single cell data sets and as he mentioned, there are a lot of uh, there are many tools and can, that that can give you different ideas and aspect of the communication. As he said, by we are developing a new approach that could study context. Other tools could be focused on spatial transcriptomics and and so on. So the idea, of, rather than showing you result of our research, now I'm going to show you some resources that are available for studying cell cell communication and, and using these kind of data sets. So as you saw earlier, <laughs> this brief introduction, basically cell cell communication are everywhere happening across a multicellular organism. As we run, our muscles are interacting like at the cellular level, even for breathing, um, we, we need cell cell communication and interaction. They are present everywhere in life during cellular differentiation for the regular functioning of uh, tissues and organs. For our immune system, they are really important because this is the way that 
uh, our cells can protect us from different pathogens, diseases, and malfunctioning uh, within our organs. And because of some failures in the way they, the cells communicate, that could lead into different diseases. And that's why also it's important to, to study them. Cell cell communication in particular is a subtype of cell cell interaction. Cell cell interaction is like a broader uh, name for, for, for this kind of uh, communications. And the communication could happen in different ways depending on the proximity of the cells, um, the signals they are sending, the, what are the molecules uh, mediating this communication, as uh, you can see here in this figure. Uh, one way could be cells interacting with itself, like autocrine uh, communication or sending signal to other cells through a paracrine communication. And even if they are in, in touch with other cells and they can be mediated by proteins that allows the passing signals from inside of one cell to, to the other cell or even through the circulatory system, like longer distances, sending hormones to a cell that is located in another part of the, of the body. To do so, cells require different kind of molecules. Usually the signals they send, they are ligands, and the ligands could be a variety of different molecules that could be uh, different kind of hormone, neurotransmitters, ions, small compounds like metabolites or something that cells are producing. Um, even and some peptides and proteins. In the case of receptors, usually these are proteins that could be in, in the cell surface or in, in, in the intracellular space of, of, of the cells. And what happens with this interaction between a ligand and a receptor, usually as you can see in this other figure, when a receptor receives a signal from coming from the same cell or another cell, usually this triggers uh, a signaling, signaling cascade inside the cell and going through different processes like intracellular interaction of cell, other molecules until finally triggering the activation of some genes and, and that could change the way that cells are functioning. But as Nate showed before, um, for, <clears throat> for studying uh, cell cell communication using gene expression, what we can do is use this information of gene expression as a proxy to, to infer the activity of proteins. So in, the, in this case, the study of cell-cell interaction communication is more intended to study the ones that are mediated through proteins. And, and in this case, protein could be mediating cell-cell contacts, as you see here, uh, secreted signaling that where cells secrete a protein into the extracellular space and that those proteins could be received by other cells or even with the extracellular matrix interacting with receptor in, in, in some cells. So as you saw earlier, basically the, the general workflow for a science also communication with uh, transcriptomics is basically you have the transcriptomic data set generated from different experiments. You generate your gene expression matrix that in, in this workshop you, you've seen like different ways to do that. And next week also you, you will do some analysis with this. But what is also important here is uh, information that you add to the, the transcriptomic data set that is the case of the knowledge about which ligand receptor pairs are interacting. And you can use that information to, to constrain your transcriptomic data set and infer like some scores for each ligand receptor pair given the expression they have in one cell or cell type or sample or depending on the level, the resolution you have in your data set and with another cell or tissue sample and so on to, to have an idea which pathways of signaling uh, these cells could be using or ligand, more specifically ligand receptor pairs. And also you can aggregate this score and have an overall idea of the interaction.
And as Nate mentioned before, and there are many tools. That they have different features, different way to visualize these results. And that could help you to interpret different um, hypotheses and, and so on. But basically what I'm going to focus in, the, in this um, talk is in these two aspects. One is the resources available about the knowledge of ligand receptor pairs that you need to integrate with this trans transcriptomic data set. And the main tools or approaches for computing this part of the communication scores and, and, and weighting different ligand receptor pairs depending on their expression and, and see which of them are more likely being used by a pair of cells. So in this talk, I, I'll, I'll show you uh, two main aspects. One is the knowledge, that is the <clears throat> ligand receptor pairs available, the way to construct this list, or, and how different studies have, have been in, incorporating this. The other aspect is the analysis, how you can use this information, which tools are available, and, and different example on this application. Nate already showed you some analysis we've done in, in the lab. So I'm, I'm not going into those details. It's more intended to show you like what is available here to, to do so. And if I have enough time, I could show you some validation procedures that people are, are doing and, and a new technique, as I, I mentioned. So basically for ligand receptor pairs, I'm going to show you a little bit about the evolution of how people have been building this list, different databases, and how you can build this list for other organisms uh, different than humans and, and, and mice. For the analysis, the main categories of the tools, some difference they have, and a few examples of, of using them. And as I said, for validation, what are the main approaches, approaches for validating your predictions and, and a new technology that got published like very recently. So most of what I'm going to show you is already reviewed in, in, in our review that got published a few months ago. And here we describe more in detail different ways to do this. If you are interested in going to, and recently, probably a, a month ago, another review got published that is a very good review in, in the way they they show very well the different tools and the di main differences. Since we published our review, many other tools have been out uh, came out. So this new review also show other tools that we, we didn't mention, other resources that we didn't mention. So these are great resources for, for going more into the details. So the first part about ligand receptor pairs, <clears throat> earlier in the 2000s, this paper came out in, in Nature where they use microarray data set. So not single cell as we are used now, they, they, they were using microarrays and they came out with this idea of using ligand receptor pairs that people knew for a long time, uh, even before that bioinformatics existed. Um, and they use this information in a in a very smart way that where they they did this correlation of the expression of, of these ligand receptor pairs for each of these pairs using the microarray information and they realized some autocrine loops happening in cancer cells um, and they they got important results for, for for the for these kind of fields. And, and they created a, a first database of ligand receptor pairs given the interaction they, they knew at, at that time and in this website. And this website, I think it hasn't been updated since then, or it, it was at some point, but, but now it's, it's not as the, the, new, the new other database. So since then people started using this kind of approaches. It, it happened probably 10 years since this paper until people have again started reusing this kind of approach and even more when RNA-seq technologies came out. And as you can see in this plot, I'm showing you new lists that came out after the, this first one. 
and, and they started increasing the number of ligand receptor pairs because with new technologies, people were able to have even more information and new prediction of potential ligand receptor interaction. But mainly they, they were focusing human. So we have a lot of information for human, even for mouse, because it's an animal model that is used the most. And, and as you can see from the first list, we, we have an increasing number of ligand receptor pairs that are known. And at some point in 2015, this paper came out that is a very important paper for the field that defined around 2,000 ligand receptor pairs for human. It was the first one in surpassing the barrier of a, a thousand ligand receptor pairs. But even more, they studied um, human cell types and de they define uh, the communication network of, of those cell, cell types. So um, this ligand receptor pair database they created here has been broadly used in the field. People started even improving that list, adding new interactions or using that list as a reference to create other lists for other organisms as human, uh, as mouse and so on. And as I mentioned, they, they studied and defined the uh, cell cell communication network of human cell types. They took 144 uh, human cell types and connected them depending on the ligand receptor pairs they were using. But here in this representation, they aggregated them into five main cell types. And they saw the strength of, of the interaction, as you can see here in these arrows, and, the, and they put the number of ligand receptor pairs they were using. So that gave them a lot of information. Given the ligand receptor pairs these cells are using, they could do some enrichment analysis, have the main biological processes happening, depending on the cell types, sending, as you can see here, mesenchymal cells, sending signal to other, like epithelial signaling, and so on. And this. Uh, had a, a huge impact in the in, in in the single cell field since now you can get this kind of information and then pe uh, people started doing different analysis in different organisms, different diseases and biology questions. Since this list of ligand receptor pairs came out, um, different groups are starting using these ligand receptor pairs, even adding more information, but something that uh, a group of, the, of bioinformatics and biology people uh, were wondering. So we have the interaction of ligand receptor pairs and usually it's one protein interacting with another protein. But something that happens in reality is uh, you need a complex of proteins that could be a receptor interacting with one ligand or more proteins that are uh, composing that ligand. As for example, in this figure, you, we have some receptor for cytokines that usually are made by different subunits and each subunit could be a different protein. So in order to be functional, they need all those different subunits being expressed simultaneously. And that wasn't uh, accounted for in, in the previous analysis. And usually a ligand receptor pairs didn't consider uh, these complexes, just one protein to one protein. And now they started building new lists, including that information like, okay, now you have a complex. So for that, probably in the analysis, you need something that all those uh, proteins in the complex are, are expressed. So that's how cell phone DB, one, one of the available tools came out and, and they also incorporated this information. They, they build this of ligand receptor pairs, as you can see here in this figure, where a receptor could be different subunits, the same for ligands. And now you have that whole interaction happening and, and, and considering that information. Previous lists on, only consider, for example, interaction between subunit one with, of the receptor with the subunit one of the ligand, and that's all the interaction they consider. And up in a separate way, they consider the other interaction between subunit two and subunit two of the ligand as well. But now it's all the group interacting with all the other group. 
so for that they they build a list of around uh, 900 interactions but that few years after that this new tool cell chat also was considering this complex information of interactions and they increase even more the, the number of ligand receptor pairs now we have around 2000 interactions and that has helped a lot a lot to to have um, a good result representing actually a, a, a biological function rather than just the interaction that may be not happening in in reality and the way they incorporate these complexes is usually so if you don't have expressed one of the subunit you should you should not consider that interaction as something happening right so for that for example if you have a complex in the receptor cell db consider the minimum expression among the different components of that receptor so if we have a zero expression for what subunit we assign a zero expression for the whole complex. So with that, we can infer that the communication through that interaction is not happening. Uh, cell chat do something similar, but instead of using the minimum express expression, they take the geometric mean. So when you multiply this different expression of the component, if you have a one expression that is zero, the whole complex will have a, an a score of zero for, for computing the communication score. So that's something that new that was added to the, the field. And after that, people also realize other functionality that should be considered. And one is like, as I showed before, when receptors receive these signals that could trigger some effect intracellular in, at the intracellular level, like activation of some genes. And since we have gene expression for all the genes or, or, or at least many genes in, in the cell, other people started uh, considering information that is happening downstream to the receptor, as you can see here in this paper from NicheNet, another tool available. They now map, okay, we have ligand receptor interaction, but also we have some effects that are happening intracellularly. So we have targets of those signaling pathways, which gene could be activated given the, inter the, the signaling through those, those interactions. So the, now they take the, these target genes happening downstream and they can compute a new score given the activity at the intracellular level and that can add more information. So with all these uh, available ligand receptor pairs. In, in our review, we build a GitHub repository where we put all the ligand receptor pairs that are available across different papers. So if you need them to, for doing your analysis, you can find them here. And we describe how many ligand receptor pairs we have and, and also the papers. So if you are interested in the, in the studies, you can see them. And we have some online other resources, for example, in the Bader lab, they have some information about cell cell interaction and in, um, ligand receptor pairs or protein interaction, protein protein interaction, and the way they, they got them. And so you can download them from their website. And they use this information for a publication in the aging mouse brain. So they also put available like a cell cell interaction atlas online. So you can see them and see the different signals here. The same for the paper I show you in 2015, where they published this list, they, they put the interaction between different cell, human cell types. So you can, um, if you are interested in observing some ligand receptor pairs and which cell are using them, you can use their, their tool in this website and the search button to, to look into some specific molecule. And another new database that came out is Omnipath that consider a lot of different information, not just ligand receptor pair, complete interaction. They consider even post-translational modification, uh, some functional annotation, and so on. So th this uh, database is very important and useful for adding more like biological interpretation to our analysis. And this can be easily integrated to different uh, 
languages like R, Python, even with tools like Cytoscape, you can have these networks and easily download them. So for building lists of ligand receptor pair for other organisms, since this study have been focusing humans and, and, and mice, we can take this actually curated list for humans as a reference list. And then we can go into other databases that could give us from all the genes in those ligand receptor pairs list, which are the ortholog genes for other organisms. And then we can have an idea of potential genes that could be uh, ligands or receptor in this new organism we, we are interested in. As for example, let me show you. One database for that is gProfiler. So if you go to the website of gProfiler, <clears throat> you can Google this tool gProfiler and find this website. So if you go to the website, you have different tools here. And one of them is ortology search. So here you can put a list of different genes that the one you extracted extracted in the in your ligand receptor pairs in the human list, for example. And then you, you put like your source organism, in this case it would be human. And if we are interested, for example, in C. elegans, we can put C. elegans as a target. The IDs we need, depending on the transcriptomic data set we have and how the, name, the genes are annotated. And then we can get a, a list of orthologs for C. elegans, given the, the list of genes that we, we put as an input coming from the human list. There are other databases for this, but gProfiler is, is one example. And then with these ortholog genes that you got from that third, you can go into other databases, protein-protein interaction databases as a string, for example, that has usually different organism. If you go to the is a string. So a string is something like that. You can search like for a specific protein name and see all the interaction of that protein. But if you go into the download button, you can have all the different interaction for a given organism. So since I'm interested in C. elegans, as I show, I can put here C. elegans too. C. elegans, update this, and this will give me all the protein-protein interaction that are known, either with experimental evidence or not. And you can use this database, download here the different links and some annotation aliases here for the gene and use that <clears throat> as a database where you can look into the specific gene that you got from the previous search. And now you can get that interaction that are involved in potential ligand receptor pairs. And with that list, you can do a monarch curation given what you know or what different articles have been reporting and you can have a final list as we did for C. elegans and night shot before, for example. And we got this final number of interaction coming from a reference uh, list from humans. So going to the second part of, of this talk um, about cell interactions and how to analyze them with different tools. Many tools are available here. I'm showing just four tools. In the reviews I, I mentioned before, you have a lot of different tools there. This were very well described, but main the main tools that have been used are cell phone DV, node cell chat, niche net considering dustring analysis. <laughs> and well, I, I put the one I, I've been developing cell cell to cell that is not already finished, but as Nate showed you, we will include a, a new feature and a new kind of analysis using TensorFlow. It's something to consider. And given cell chat DV and cell phone, cell phone DV and cell chat, they even have websites. So you can see more details here, documentations. You can look in for inter specific ligand receptor pairs in, in their web website. Like this is the one for cell phone DV. Cell chat two has different examples of data analysis they, they use. Um, and you can inspect this website and see what resources they also consider. 
And the main differences among the different tools are the ones summarized in, in these tables. In our review, we reviewed 13 tools and we detected four main categories given the way they compute this analysis. And <clears throat> so the main categories we put are given basically the way they compute the communication score. One category considered differentially expressed ligand receptor pairs. So with that, they infer which communication cells have. Other group of tools use a permutation to detect cell type specific interactions um, that are not that are significant and not due to random chance. Other ones are considered network approaches, as the one I mentioned with NicheNet. They consider downstream genes, and with that, they can weigh which communication pathway are happening. And tensor-based tools that consider like the the data structure and the and the correlation among data using a tensor, and and that allows to see many to many interactions simultaneously. The other review here, the, the recent one that I mentioned before, these include other tools that we didn't mention and they summarize them depending on the input they, they are using. For example, some tools that only require single cell data set, other ones that require downstream information, other ones that use a spatial information for doing the analysis and so on. So you can see more in details in, in those websites. But what I'm going to be focused now and, and and next week we will be using cell chat. That is, I think, the talk after the one I'm presenting here. They are based on permutation to get a significant communication, and that increases the confidence of your prediction. So for single cell, usually we have this cluster of cells, like this group as color here, and we can define cell types of, of those single cells. So with those clusters, you can infer the, their communication, which ligand receptor pairs they are using. Um, to get the significant interaction, we randomly shuffle the, the cell type we assign to every single cell here. And that will generate like an effect of random chance, things that are happening just because of the technique uh, noise or or some biological noise, given the sample, the way that the experiment was performed. And you can generate for each randomization, uh, one score for this ligand receptor interaction. So you, you do this multiple times, you iterate with random shuffle a lot of time, and you can generate a new distribution from this shuffling. So every time you are redefining the cluster, the, the, their composition are changing. So the once you aggregate those expressions to a single value, those values could change and, and you can generate this null distribution. Then you compute the, the score, but now with the actual cluster that you assign at, at the beginning, and you can see where that value is located in this null distribution. And if it's happening like here in this arrow in, in a position of this distribution where the probability is very small, that means that it's not happening because of, of random, uh, the, this random effect. And it's actually a meaningful interaction. And you can say, okay, these are the ligand receptor interactions that are meaningful and significant and have a more confidence of that they could be happening. These tools, and some of them have been used for whole organism analysis as Nate showed you. So, to sell, we use our tool to study C elegance and different parts of interactions. And it's available in BioArchive. Another tool that recently was published is NatMe from this group that published the ligand receptor pairs list in 2015. They now updated their analysis, create a new tool for single cell analysis, even improved their ligand receptor list, and now they studied the the whole organism, different tissues in, in mouse. They took a, the tabula muris atlas of different cell types in, across different uh, organs in, in mouse, and they study the important interaction depending on the organ, and the location, and so on. So you can go on into this article and see more details. So I think I have a few minutes, so I, I can show you really quick some validation processes once you infer the Successful communication. 
you need to validate them, right? Because it's a prediction basically from gene expression. And since it's gene expression, maybe the, the proteins could be not functioning the way we are predicting through the expression. So this other review show really well the different step for doing that. We start from the transcriptomic data set. We can infer some communication pathways and, and networks. But once we have those results, we need some experimental validation. And ways to do so could be through fluorescence to, to see the colocalization of cells that we are predicting to be interacting. So we can see that in the microscope or even label, label specific ligands and receptor and see whether they colocalize. Do some perturbation experiment either in vitro or in vivo using inhibitors for the molecules we are inferring to be important for the communication, using CRISPR-Cas to do some deletion of them and see how it changed the biological function we are studying, and do the same in, in vitro. And, and here is the new technology I mentioned before that came out a week ago. The, they developed a new tool, uh, experimental tool called RabbitSeq, that basically is using rabies virus to track the cell cell interaction and at the same time have the transcript of, of, of those interactions we can track with these viruses. So for that, what they do, with, they, they take this rabies virus, they engineer that virus in order to not infect any cell, they, they remove the glycoprotein gene here. So they can infect cells and they cannot replicate. And also the, these viruses are barcoded. So each viral particle have a different barcode and we can track that barcode with the RNA-seq. And we have a cherry protein that is expressed also and, and we can use this uh, protein for uh, cell sorting as well and, and just seg sequence the infected cells. And in order to allow a first round of infection, we need a, the glycoprotein gene, uh, protein G being expressed in a, in a transgenic way in, in the cells. So we can direct which cells we were intending to be infected. For example, in this study, they were interested in astrocytes. So they did a transgenic mouse where a promoter of astrocyte was ex expressing this protein that allows virus to infect other cells. And they also engineered the virus to, to need a, recept a specific receptor in the surface of the cells to infect them when they don't have the glycoprotein gene. EG. So a first round in this case, they they injected the different viral particle with different barcodes. And since it was a transgenic mouse, it did a first round of infection of astrocytes specifically. And since those astrocytes had the receptor, they incorporated the virus intracellularly. And since they were expressing also the glycoprotein gene, now the virus could replicate inside these astrocytes and have the glycoprotein G on their surface to infect other cells now. And when they came out of astrocytes, they will be infecting the surrounding cells, the, the ones that are interacting with those astrocytes. And now they can transfer the labels, as you can see here in this network, to the cells that are interacting with those astrocytes that got infected at first. And we can get the label from those new infected cells as too and have an idea of what are the cells interacting, the single cell interacting with the astrocytes. And since now they infect other cells that are not expressing the glycoprotein gene, uh, now this virus can't replicate and can infect other cells. So we only get the information of what are the direct cells interacting with the first round of infected astrocytes. And we can track this through the traditional ways of single cell RNA-seq since they put the barcodes for the virus, we can now trace back which were the first cells infected with this, with, with our, the other cells that got infected after interacting with this main cell. And we can get 
incorporated it with the UMI and the cell barcode. So we exactly know which single cell was infected by which viral particle and I have an idea of the interaction. And at the same time, as you can see here, we know the transcript of, because we are using the cell barcode and we can see the expression of other genes. And then they build this connectome interaction given the which was the barcode of the virus and the interaction that astrocyte had with other cells. And then they inspected the genes expressed in these other infected cells. And they got an idea of which ligand receptor pairs um, are being used through this different interaction. And, and they saw in the case of uh, multiple scler sclerosis, they used the animal model for multiple sclerosis. And they saw which are the interaction between astrocyte and microglia, for example, that are important for this disease and how the inflammation is happening and what are the the specific signal that are using these cells that were infected and and we actually know in vivo that they are interacting because of this infection using this this virus so that's all what i was going to show you today uh, just to say in our review we have a summary of different papers like what are the cells they study the objective of the study the different communication score they use and how they compute the communication score, which are the ligand receptor pairs list they use, and a lot of other information that may be useful for you and depending on your data set you have, maybe compare this database we have. If this is in the supplementary material, and you can get an idea of how to do the, the analysis for your um, data set that you are interested in. So given that, I would like to thank uh, Nate and people in the lab too, that they've been helping with different projects and giving some ideas, different aspects, discussion to especially Harat, Chintan and Isaac that are being also working on this cell cell interaction field. People from Oliver lab, Oliver Harris Mandy and our officer, we work together for doing this uh, review. Um, also, I need from Chile for supporting me and allowing me to study here in UC San Diego and Fulbright too. Given that I would take any question here, you can have my contact information in case you are interested in asking me a question or your yeah, discussion or something else. So thanks everyone. I hope this helped you for, for new analysis in your field. Hi, Eric, thank you very much for your talk. We thank have you. a few questions here, mm -hmm. so we're gonna start with those, okay? Um, aside from uh, ligand receptor pairs, what mm -hmm. other types of cell-cell communication processes can be captured with this approach? In case, for example, we want to unveil different cell-cell interactions, should we need to modify the methods? Well, usually these methods are very general. So you can apply it for the whole data set you have, or you can subset if you are interested in a specific cell types. You can filter the other cells and just take the ones you are interested in. And you can start going into the details and, and see what you want to ask uh, or, or what question you want to respond. So you can so you use can, the you can choose the, the input. Yeah, yeah. You can choose, you can choose. Basically. if you have a okay. So if you have a hypothesis of how they would interact, then you mm -hmm. would use different sets, right? So yeah. just ligand receptor would be the more obvious one. Mm -hmm. So that's why I go with that. And, and even you can filter, for example, if you are interested only on surface proteins, you can filter the interaction and just consider surface proteins and instead of the secreted ones and just yes, study them. Cool. Uh, what are the main computational requirements to perform this type of analysis? Is it possible to run them on a laptop or would you recommend always using a server? So good question. <laughs> and it, it depends too. Um, personally, I've been running all my analysis on my laptop. <laughs> so you can do that. 
Um, but also it depends on the size of your data set, right? If you have huge data sets and a lot of single cells, probably your laptop would be not enough for just loading the data set. So in that case, you, you might need a, a server. In the case of C elegance, the data set wasn't a huge data set. So I, I could open it with my laptop and, and do all the analysis. And since I, I've been developing the cell to cell tool, I have everything on my laptop. And as I was doing analysis, I, I, I was changing the function of my tool to, to do a different analysis and so on. So it would depend on the size of what you're yeah. doing, but otherwise it would run, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so great talk. Uh, how much of the predictions are validated? Maybe considering different tools, is there information about that of the percentage that have been validated? How does that work? So that's a, a good question too. Um, actually in the cell cell interaction field, that something that is really hard to do is a validation because you just have the transcriptomics and, and then you have some prediction, but you're not sure that those predictions are real or, or not. In, in the way that could be a biological meaning. So for that, as I showed in the last slides, people are developing different technologies, like the one to trace the interaction with the viruses. Uh, other people have done other technologies to see uh, cells that are physically interacting. Other people have used inhibitors of a specific ligand receptor pairs and see whether they are having a function as expected given the interaction. So you can do those experiments or even as Nate showed before, you can go into the papers and, and see whether some people have reported something about what you found in that field specifically. That can give you an idea of how much confidence you can have in your results. And you, during the development of the tools that you do, do you look for that? Do you look for the validations? Um, yeah, usually, usually I've been, since I, I'm not doing experiments and I need to quickly have an idea of how good the prediction could be, usually I look into the papers and try and take data sets as the COVID one where a lot of people have been working. So we have a better idea of what could be happening. We take those data sets and run the analysis and, 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 and see whether our prediction are consistent or not with what other people have reported. Okay, great. Um, and a final one here. Thank you. Very interesting application of single cell RNA seq. How do you detect the expression of known protein ligands using single cell RNA seq data? Do you detect expression of metabolic pathways associated to the known protein link, uh, ligand synthesis? Well, that, that's something that could be done. And actually, with Nate and other people in the lab, we, we have had that discussion before. And directly, you cannot like have metabolites or other molecules that are not protein. But there are other tools and other analysis in other fields that you can do. For example, in metabolism, uh, you can use gene expression to infer the activity of which uh, metabolic pathways are occurring. Those once you have an idea of what metabolic pathways could be happening, and especially in Nate's lab, uh, it, the Metabolism is one of the biggest field in, in the, happening in the lab. Um, you can infer, okay, uh, now you have uh, this pathway happening, so these metabolites could be present. And, and given that these metabolites could be interacting with other receptor in this other cell, given their expression. And um, Nate is telling me site seek is one technology that probably could do that with. I was going to mention that that for site seek, that's an interesting approach where you could actually measure the protein abundance for the receptors at the same time while doing single cell RNA seq. Because what you're actually doing is using a, a barcoded antibody to detect the protein abundance. And some of these techniques would be incredibly powerful for going beyond just transcript correlations and that, but actually measuring the protein abundances. But again, the metabolite side is a little, is a little more tricky because they're smaller, but. Yeah, but at least you can infer the presence of metabolites using other tools from the metabolism field. 
that is doable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. I think that we can wrap up with this. Uh, um, welcome everybody back to the second part of the evening for the workshop. Um, so for this evening, we have two very exciting talks um, and three speakers actually. One, uh, the first talk is going to be uh, co-hosted by our first two speakers. So our first speaker is going to be Dr. King Nie. So Dr. King Nie is a Chancellor's Professor of Mathematics, Developmental and Cell Biology and Biomedical Engineering at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, he is the director of the NSF Simon Center for Multiscale Cell Fate Research, jointly funded by the NSF and the Simons Foundation, one of the four national centers uh, on mathematics of complex biological systems. Uh, so in research, he uses system biology and data-driven methods to study complex biological systems with focuses on single cell analysis, multiscale modeling, cellular plasticity, stem cells, embryonic development, and their applications to disease. Uh, so Dr. Nia has published more than 170 research articles and in training, he has supervised more than 40 postdoctoral fellows and PhD students, with many of them working in academic institutions. Dr. Nia is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a fellow of American uh, Physical Society, and a fellow of Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, it's a very big honor to have him here. And he's going to share the presentation with uh, Dr. Suo Qingjin, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Mathematics in University of California, Irvine as well. Um, so Dr. Jing has been working with Dr. Nie during the past four years on developing novel comp computational tools on analyzing the single cell RNA-seq data, as well as the single cell attack-seq data, and using those tools to study various complex biological systems. In the summer of 2021, Dr. Jing will join Wuhan University as an associate professor. So together, they're going to talk, talk us uh, about the spatiotemporal reconstruction of multicellular interactions from single cell genomics data. Uh, so thank you very much for being here. Please uh, feel free to start whenever you're ready. OK, and can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. OK. So thank you and thank you for the invitation. And uh, so glad to be here and to give the talk. Um, so when I think about the bio, when I think about the biologic systems, I, I think it's a complex and a very dynamic, right? And as all we know, the biologic system contains many scales from organ, cell, and within the cell, the genes, the genetic information. So at the center of this complex system is cells, okay? Um, in the recent years, we all know, um, the, the single cell sequencing technology and allows us to do uh, unprecedented uh, profiling of cell information. And uh, for example, let's use the skin as an example, and the skin is very dynamic and the interactive system with many different types of cells that talk to each other and make transitions, right? And for example, you, you can see here, you have immune, you have epidermal, you have dermos. And, but when we sequence it, we actually dissociate, as you all know, we dissociate the cells. And then we're looking at it and uh, clustering it, and we're looking at the cells uh, in a static way. Okay, so on the other hand, we often want to obtain our discovery, our findings usually strongly associated with the world's mechanisms. When you, when you talk about the mechanisms, it's actually, it's a dynamical information, right? Somebody affects somebody, somebody interact with somebody. So on the other hand, the data we're collecting so I think uh, this is the third or the fourth day of the workshop now. 
The data set for single cell genomics data, usually it's a matrix and uh, the access direction is not is the cells, then, then this direction is the genes. So one hand, we have a static matrix data. We might have many of those. On the other hand, our goal is what? To find, for example, potentially the edge of the wound. So this is our paper and how the edge of the wound are moving, what kind of cells are there, how they interact with and each other. So, so basically is, um, if I give you a static picture, right? In particular, if you're looking at the picture on the left and the right, so of course those are the uh, things we're very familiar with. If I give you this picture in your head, you can pretty much make a predictions what those things are gonna go, right? For example, on the right is the bubble in the beer, and on the left is the water wave. Now, of course, those can be described on our first principles, dynamic Stokes equations. So, so I'm proud to say the the experiment on the left, the imaging. You know, I took that imaging, but now you can see since it's, it's moving, right? So, so the question is, are we able to from the static picture to get kind of a moving information and get to the dynamic information? So I'm going to use in the, the examples. Um, some of the methods developed in my lab and uh, to illustrate those points. So uh, we're first to looking at the transitions, okay, you infer transitions. So what do you mean by transitions? So uh, many of you might be familiar with the system of epithelium mesenchymal transition, right? Uh, okay. So traditionally in the old days, and the, when people think about this transition, this is the zero one transition means you either epithelium or mesenchymal. But in reality, you can think, if we're only looking at the marker genes, the, your favorite genes, the E gene, right? Epithelium genes, okay? Everybody in the community might have diff slight different favorite, the E genes. And then there's many way actually make the transitions, okay? <clears throat> now, uh, some of this, well, of course, I made a, 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 a plot for all the plausible transitions might not be the real biological, okay? But the people actually nowadays during the last five, 10 years, people have already found the hybrid state here, okay? Now is the hybrid state more like that or more like that, okay? Now this is the view of a two dimension, okay? Now we can also go into um, three now. So you have E gene, you have M gene, right? And then uh, if you have another marker, and what is the transition going to look like? Then the transition can be really complicated. Okay. So now what's the, the, the other X though? Often the other X could be what? Could it be a gene? Could it be a protein? Could it be a, a, a marker? Um, and it could be cell morphology, right? So in the context of EMT, people already has the evidence shows uh, the transition is dynamic. That's an intermediate cell state, okay? So the black white picture is not quite right. And the first, that means you, you might have some cells in the process which are not E and not M. All right, so to study that, and in particular to study the epithelium transition uh, in, the uh, in the context of, of single cell only sick data, Okay, so, and we developed the tools. I, I don't wanna bother you with the mathematical details. Basically we introduced a, a, a cell plasticity index, okay, to quantify uh, the likelihood of the cells actually can make the transitions, okay? So let me, uh, instead of giving the message, let me use the example for illustration, to, to, to illustration. So before we say, okay, our message, to, to test our message, we develop the model. Basically we develop the truth, um, uh, a ground truth by simulations and using a gene regulatory network model and, uh, and it shows on the laptop and it's a dynamic system model. Uh, but it's an agent-based model, you contract individual cells. 
And then you can generate the heat map, right? We're all familiar with the heat map. This is the, a classic single cell data format, right? It's a cell on the top and a gene on the bottom. But the difference here is instead of you have a static shot now because it's, a, it's based on simulation, we can capture everything uh, in real time, uh, in time. And then we can basically do almost like a lineage tracing. We can track every cell, how it goes, okay? And then of course we can identify what are the transition cells, okay? And then we apply our method for the quantity C on the modeling data, right? So you, you can see here on the top left, we have, we have three colors. Basically we have, we have a five state. There's some cell which is making transition. There's a two intermediate state, which is, which, oh, sorry, which is, which is a bit stable. Okay. And then we have a, the, the, you, we can see the passes and it goes from here to here. Now, if you could look, if you want looking at the transition score, okay, which is the, um, we call CPI. And then you can see the cell goes from the light blue and uh, which is zero means it's very unlikely to make transition and to, to do, okay, and in between, and then you have one. So of course you can quantify each cell cycle or what cell type. You can look at the genes, which, which are, are, are important for the transitions, okay? And then, then of course you, you really want to looking at the real data. We're looking at the one uh, SCC uh, a, a data set. So I just want to show you looking at here and you can see what five different kinds of cells now the color you, you can see it's it's not you know there's a four different colors but once you look at the transitions that's four different states okay you can see the e goes to m now for this case they don't call mesenchymal they can quasi mesenchymal and there's an intermediate state in the here okay there's another inter uh, 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 intermediate state there all right so you can quantify it you can draw paths and everything and of course you can do uh uh, 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 to looking at the genes, one of your favorite genes, okay? And then you can looking at how the genes changes in the past, right? So I just showed you, show you the, the, this is the published work and the, the, the code, uh, the package, and the papers are rare. I just want to give you illustrations what the key things you can get. And then you can also, instead of to only look at the cancer, you can look at development, EMT uh, in the development, right? For that case, you can see a transition, which is much more linear with only one intermediate state, okay? And uh, so of course you can looking at the key genes, drive the transitions in, in the bottom half. All right, so that's one tool. Another tool we developed, uh, which is little, uh, it is not it, which is more driven by the multi-scale modeling tools. And uh, so we translate the transition in, into a language of dynamic systems for, for people who are aware of a dynamic system language is, is okay, if you have a stable state here, there's another stable, state. you're making the transitions that, that there might be a kind of a unstable state is right here. The question is how you capture both stable states and kind of unstable states and something in the middle. Now, why you call a multi-scale? So in principle, you care about what? You care about the one cell? No, not necessary. You might be care about a group of cells. And you, that group of cell could be five cell, could be a whole cell, a whole uh, cluster of cells, right? So that's the way you can do multi-scale. You can do coarsening. Um, so instead of talking the details is, I just, let me show you. Then we can present this in a very dynamic way. So if you are familiar with the Wellington landscape, okay? So basically it says here is, it's an individual dot, it's a cell. You can see the cells are, are, are making transitions. Now this happens to be EMT systems. And then you can even quantify, you know, we can quantify, right? The probability, the likelihood, yeah, goes from the IPS theory to medicine time of 68% goes from here. And the 32 goes from there. And then, then you can, for, for the blood, Okay, so our system, you have really complex, oh, sorry, this is not a blood system. It's another system. You can see really complex transitions by looking at this kind of a Wellington landscape, okay? And then um, now, again, if you have so many cells, now that's the challenge you are facing now. How could you analyze 
so many cells at the same time. For example, you could, uh, we often now say I know, hundreds and of thousands, you know, 200,000 of cells. And we recently collect the wound healing system of 200,000 cells. Now, of course, tracking in all individual cells is nearly impossible computationally in this way. Okay, then you can do coarsening. Coarsening means I can group them, right? And how to group them? You said, oh, maybe it's, we just use the nearest neighbors and go. So that will now work well, and we demonstrated. And then by using those approach, we can looking at the transition paths, okay? Now, this is an example, has a very complex uh, transition path, which is a blood uh, 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 systems, okay? So you can quantify, and then you, you, can, you, you can draw the links, and then to see very complex transitions, okay? Remember, this is from a static data set, okay? It's not like we, we have many temple points, okay? All right, so, um, so let me jump into, so this morning we heard, I uh, talk about cell cell communications and uh, we're, um, so I, I don't need to bother you with the details now. And the uh, Sujin will talk about more basic cells. If let's focus on legal receptor, right? If I send a cell in the talking and the center the, uh, uh, release the, uh, Mientras encuentras algo, o sea, ¿qué tal que uh, release, um, with diffusive molecules, right, Ligon? And some cell will capture, some cell will not capture, and how to estimate. So, so at the single cell level, at the individual cell level, and you can estimate through some simple um, probability calculations. So we did that about two years ago now. And then basically is we can quantify the how the cell talk to each other by looking at the many individual cells as group. So in a, in a, in a simple language, basically is if cell A ligand high and it can correlate a group of cell A ligand high and then the receptor also high, the downstream signal also high, and then there's a high probability they actually talk to each other, right? So that's kind of a guiding principle. Then we derive uh, a kind, uh, kind of interactions between different cells. So now, of course, it's specific on BMP and the TGF beta. All right. So the later today, and uh, Su Jin will be very specific to talking about uh, the tool, and he developed called Cell Chat. So I would like Su Jin to talk about more details. So what I want to say is, instead of just say that the details of the tools, I say. Now you also face a challenge though, know, because the original cell are all dissociated with most, most of the single cell data are collected with the cells has very specific spatial information, okay? So on the right, you're looking at actually is a picture of staining of two genes for skin, okay? So you can see there's a two genes on the right. That's, that's beautiful, right? On the other hand, it's only two genes. If you're interested in some other genes and you are not be able to obtain. On the left, and it's a single cell, and I say you have all the genes, but you don't have spatial information. Now, can you link them now? Right, so that's can you link. So we developed the tools instead to give you all the mathematical details. We, we developed the tool called Optimum Transport. Basically is you have a distribution on the left, a distribution on the right, and somehow we can connect them. Now, of course, if you have only two genes on the right, it's very difficult to connect. But if you have 30 genes, 20 genes, you can imagine if this two data sets coming from the same system, they must, they must have some similar patterns from the left and the right, right? Um, oh, I'm getting the questions. I will answer later about the transition. Sorry, I have a total missed, okay? Um, so I will answer that later. So I just saw uh, the questions. Yeah, no, don't worry. I I will um, I will read you the questions at the end of the talk. Okay. So and then uh, now by using that approach, let's let's use a simple example. And uh, because uh, uh, it's not a simple example, this is a Drosophila. Oh, sorry. On the top left, it's a uh, uh, it's not Drosophila. The Drosophila is in the bottom right. It's the zebra fish, right? So it, it's a zebra fish. So they have a kind of spatial imaging, okay? How many of us? 47 of them, but not a spatial imaging. For that case, it's not a spatial transcomes data. It's only individual genes and the 47 of them. Then we stack with them together. And then in the meantime, 
and they have the single cell ion sick data. And then we can use these two pieces of information, connect them, and then connect them to get spatial info, kind of get a spatial communication, the information kind of flow. Do you see the arrow? So basically says the BMP information basically like going that way. And the wind information goes to the, the left to right, and the, and the BMP go to left to the to the from the bottom to the top. Okay, and then you then you can looking for the, on the right bottom. So for people who are familiar with the Drosophila system, the fly this is the whole uh, fly embryo, right? It's a typical fly embryo system. You can do coarsening. So so three point one one says it's really a subclass of a cell. Now why it's a subclass of the class the three? It's three point one, right? It's a subclass of a class. Of three. It's we based on the communication patterns. Okay. And then you, you can draw all sorts of information, how they talk to each other. Of course, for this signal, and uh, we're specifically looking at uh, uh, WG, which is windless, okay? It's, it's, uh, it's the homologue of the wind, right? And so you can look at wind, you can look at the DPP. D DPP is more like a, a homologue of the BMP. And then of course, we use 84 one gene spatial images, right? And as well as the, single cell ion sick data, we use our tools, I uh, showed the optimal transport tools, and then we can link them to gain such communicate. Now, of course, this can be, our tool can be easily used on spatial transform data sets. You know, you, for the, those who have single cell resolution, not all the, if you don't have single cell resolution, we still can use it, just whatever resolution you, you have, and then we plot it in, and then we're looking at the spatial mapping and the patterns, okay? So, now, the next challenge is, I think most of you is facing now, if it's a four, five years ago, this is not a challenge. Now with more data sets and the data sets from different lab and the data sets even from the same lab, but at a different time, okay? Or, okay, or different uh, um, conditions, you know, disease, mutations, how are you gonna integrate it? Now, the most challenging reason when you integrate such material set, then you then you face a two major things. You observe some differences, right? And uh, but the difference could be coming from two kinds. One is technical error, not necessarily error. Technical variations because of different batches. Okay, we could, people here must know the batch effect, right? Or it can be intrinsic. Okay. So the, how to distinguish such a batch effect uh, and the intrinsic effect, right? So, um, so we developed a, a, a method called SMC, which was published earlier this year. And uh, so instead, since I don't have much of time, I instead to give you the, what's the principle is, you know, we, so look at this. We, we want to, the, the goal is to find, to find the technical effect somehow subtract it out then whatever the, the, the variation you observe is biological as much as possible. Yeah, of course you cannot be get rid of all of them. And, right? and then basically it's just by compare uh, different batches and, and also compare the batches within, oh, sorry, not a batch, compare the different classes within. For example, you have two group of cells, right? You have two group of cells. The, 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 if the variation between, between these two batches, okay, that, but they are the same, same type of cell. And another type of cell, their difference potentially can be computed. And if they are similar, then you argue, wow, that difference could be technical. Okay, and then you subtract it. Okay, so that's the general principle, okay? And then, we compared with many existing uh, uh, popular uh, uh, method, right? Um, now, the nice thing is now there are many existing um, metric benchmark and to to test, okay, to test the you know how good they conserve the biological variation, how good they are uh, 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 be able to remove the batch effect. There's many. Uh, metric. Our metric, what do we have, what do you have observed here, but there's many numbers here, it's very hard for you to read, okay? If you trust my words, is where 
were the best in terms of maintaining the biological variations. Oh, well, it's easy when you put in many data sets to integrate, you remove batch effect, so-called batch effect that, that might potentially contain biological variations, okay? So basically some of the methods tend to be over aligned and, uh, and we compared here and the uh, is one example, tend to be over aligned means they, they, uh, they tend to remove the two differences and by align two data sets. And this basically is an example of uh, showing, you know, the our method be able to find some new cell types, which is called uh, 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 the, the new cell types right here, but somehow got removed uh, from other popular uh, method. And the one major strength because of our methods we, is after integration, we can get a very nice short time trajectories. That's critical now. For, for example, on the top, for the harmony, for Sarah, the Liger, the, the, if you do a classic uh, uh, trajectory analysis, you will not be able to have a clean uh, path, all right? So of course, we, uh, you know, one, another strength we can use a lot of batches, okay? Here is 16 batches. And uh, so we're the one doing the best. So I just, and you can also use the SCMC to do uh, a taxi data. I don't know many of you are fam familiar with the single cell ataxia data, right? So that's um, um, uh, kind of a, a, a strength. So that, let me finish up since I, I, I already got 30 minutes. I don't want to take time. So, and then the next thing is we're actually working on integrate the single cell, multiple single cell data. One is you're looking at a single cell RNA sick data, you tend to be more um, uh, continuous. And if you're looking at the ataxia data, which is more kind of a sparse, okay? So if you want to put them together, actually it's computationally, it's challenging. Sparse, another one is near binary, okay? Sparse and near binary, and then the single cells are more continuous, okay? The single cell, uh, the, also the size of the matrix is quite different, how to integrate them. And we have a method called the SCAI. It's a machine learning method, I don't want to. So let me finish up. I don't want to uh, take, and uh, here basically is another one to, uh, to predict uh, the single cell bindings um, from transcription factors by using uh, somehow use the chipsec data and the DNA sequencing data and uh, using the bulk one to do a trainings and then using single cell to do predictions. So let me finish up saying, okay, uh, the single cell data provides us unprecedented uh, 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 resolution, right, for the cells. Now the challenge is you have to kill the animal to, to, to do the measurement. And once you do that, and then you then data you collect it, it becomes static. Now, if you work very hard, and if you have a lot of money, you, you, you can collect a lot of temporal data, but at, at the end of the day, you need to link them, and then you need to infer them from the static data and to, to, to uncover the mechanisms, which is the key, right? So we often say we want to uncover the, the mechanism always, it's a language of a dynamic. And then uh, cells are always has a communication with others. Cells never be able to sit in their own uh, okay, um, uh, vacuum, right? So then I talk about a few methods to, to infer it. And then uh, uh, Su Chin will talk about one specific one. And uh, so now once you have more data, all kinds of data, the multi-omics data, or even the RNA with the same type, and then you come from two different labs, different time. How did you control the variations? Okay. So that's uh, basically, that's so there's a lot of opportunity here. And I think this is just the beginning of a kind of a new uh, single cell revolution uh, uh, in biology. So before I pass this to subject, thank all the student postdoc who did the fantastic work and uh, I'm very, very lucky to work with a group of excellent postdoc students. And thank you for your attention. So next I will give this to uh, Su Qin and uh, he will 
give you more specific uh, description on his method cell chain. All right, so let me stop here. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. So can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you for the invitation and uh, uh, it's glad to hear to talk about our new tool cell chat uh, for the inference and analysis of sensor communication from a single cell and sick data. So our work has just been published in energy communication uh, two months ago. And so the first part, I will give a brief overview of our tool, and then I will give a short tutorial of how to use the cell chat to analyze the real single cell ANSIC data. So to infer the cell communication, we first, uh, uh, we first curate a database of the ligand receptor interactions. So for our database, we not only consider the ligand and receptor interaction, we also consider the Subunit structure of the ligand receptor. For example, the ligand receptor may have multiple subunit. One example is the TGF beta signal pathway. So when the ligand TGF beta bonding to the receptor, it requires the presence of both receptors, TGF beta R1 and TGF beta R2. So they need the presence of both subunits. And in addition, we also take into account other cofactors, such as the Agonist and antagonist, as well as the co-receptors. So these cofactors can uh, positively or negatively to control the uh, interaction between the ligand and the receptor. So our we curate this uh, ligand receptor database uh, based on the CAIG signal pathway database and also the recent literature. So so in total we have about uh, in our database our database called the CHDB. And we have about 2,000 ligand receptor pairs. And these ligand receptor pairs are classified into three categories, including the uh, secreted signaling, ECM receptor, and the cell cell contact. So all these interactions are actually have the, uh, have the reference. The, these interactions are the literature that can support it. So in addition, we also create a website that allow users to easily to Explore our database. For example, you can input a signal pathway name and then it returns all the ligand receptor pairs that are associated with this signal pathway. So we also have the, for example, this is the uh, evidence where we curate this ligand receptor pair. And currently, we have both the mouse and the human uh, interactions. Next, I will briefly to uh, show how we infer the set of communication from the data. So the first step is uh, identify the differentially expressed signal genes across the cell groups. So the second is that we calculate the average expression of the genes in a uh, cell groups because we want to infer the set of communication between cell groups instead of individual cells. So the third step is for a particular ligand receptor pair, we can calculate the communication probability from cell group I to cell group G. So in this formula, we consider the entire consider the expression of the ligand receptor and also some other cofactors such as the agonist, antagonist, as well as the co-receptor and the subunit. Uh, uh, subunits information. So the last step is we identify the significant communications using a permutation test. So basically using these four steps, we can infer a sensor communication network. Uh, so in this network, we quantify the interaction strength using this uh, communication probability that are defined by this uh, formula. So we, in, in previous, we, we just talked about when, when we, uh, for example, here, we, when we infer the set of communication, we 
uh, in, we quantify the communication probability for a particular ligand receptor pair. However, we can also uh, infer the set communication for a signaling pathway because in, in our database, we uh, classified the ligand receptor pair into a, a pathway based on the literature. So uh, how do we define the communication probability of a signaling pathway? So this is uh, uh, this word calculated by summarizing the probability of its associated uh, ligand receptor pairs. For example, this is, uh, for example, for the TGF beta signaling pathway, and uh, uh, here we show the contribution of each ligand receptor pair. Here we see that the TGF beta uh, beta one signaling is the major signaling. So in the TGF beta signaling pathway. So in summary, so cell can infer the set of communication network for both individual ligand receptor pair and the signaling pathway. So this is the overview of our, our framework, our serial chat. And uh, so after you get the sales of communication network, uh, so serial chat provides different ways to realize this complex sales of communication network. For example, you can use a hierarchy plot, the circle plot, called the diagram and heat map. So these plot allow you to uh, realize the sales of communication for a particular ligand receptor a pair or a particular signal pathway. And the bubble plot is useful when you realize the set of communication networks for, uh, uh, for, for several ligand receptor pairs. For example, here, the each row is a, a pair of ligand receptor, and each column is a communication from uh, one cell group to another. So in addition to the realization, we also uh, provide different ways to interpret the uh, complex sets of communication networks. So here we provide a several rapid analysis that allow you to do some uh, functional analysis. For example, here, the cell chat can predict the signaling rules of the cell groups using the network centrality analysis. For example, it can predict the which cell groups is the major sources, which cell group is the major target. And uh, also it can predict uh, how does the cells and the signals that are coordinated for together using a pattern uh, analysis. So here, for example, there are different cell groups and we find that some groups are associated with one pattern and this, this pattern is associated with some other signaling pathways. And the third is that we can also pre Cell chat can also predict the signals that have a similar communication architecture using the manifold learning and classification approach. For example, here, this, uh, in this low dimension space, we project the signal pathway or the cell communication network associated with signal pathway into this low dimension space. And then you can clearly see that some signal pathway are, uh, are close to each other and some signal pathway are separate from each other. So you can find the similarities between the signal pathway or the similarity between the cell cell communication networks. And uh, in addition to the individual data set analysis, we also provide different ways to analyze the, uh, to perform the compression analysis for the multiple data sets. And so for example, here is the, uh, this bar chart can show the comparison of the number of interactions between the two data sets. And this one can hit map shows whether the communication between two cell groups is increased or decreased. And uh, this 2D part shows that uh, we jointly project the signal pathway from the two data sets. So for, for example, here is a, a square representing the signal pathway from the data sets one and a circle representing the signal pathway from data set two. So here, uh, using this analysis, we can identify uh, signaling groups that may be specific to one data set. And we may can also identify the signaling groups that are shared between two data sets. And uh, this slug bar child can allow you to, uh, uh, to identify which signal pathway is, uh, is the turn on or turn off from one condition to another condition. So in our paper, we have applied our method to both mouse and human single cell ancestor data sets. And 
I will not give a detail here, but you can find uh, our application in our paper. So our package is uh, uh, implemented as a, as a R package, and uh, it is freely available on GitHub. And currently there are a lot of people are using it. And uh, our package is very easy to install using one command, and uh, it's very easy to use. So you can create a search object from a data matrix or from a short object or the single cell experience object. And we also create a, a website that allow you to uh, explore the search communication. For example, if you click this one, this is searchat.org. And uh, let's see, okay. So on this website, you see that it uh, contains two major components. One is the legend receptor interaction uh, database I just showed uh, before. And another is that the sensor communication networks that are analyzed by cell chat. So here you can, for example, here you can input the signal pathway name and you can see the uh, sensor communication network that are inferred by cell chat and also some other uh, analysis. Uh, so yeah, this is our uh, our online website that allow you to perform some interactive analysis. So next, in next few minutes, I will show you the uh, show you example how we use the CL chat to infer the cell communication. So this is the GitHub, so you can go to the GitHub. Um, so on this GitHub, we provide a command that can install our package. It's very easy, just to install GitHub. And uh, in some cases, you also need to instance it. And uh, uh, importantly, we provide several tutorials that allow you to easier to use the cell chat. For example, this is the first tutorial that can analyze a single data set means a single experiment. So we have uh, a lot of uh, a lot of functions and uh, and all details about the function, uh, some detailed explanations and uh, the result. So you can reproduce uh, all the analysis. And the second uh, tutorial is the complete analysis or the multiple data set. So you can here you can compare the uh, communication network between the different data sets. And uh, there are also some other tutorial. If you have your own ligand receptor pairs and if you want to update our database, you will also provide a tutorial. And uh, then I will, uh, I will show an example to how to run this uh, package. And uh, so here, first we show that But how uh, I think we've lost we've lost him. I um, think he will come back, don't worry. Oh. <laughs> I <see>. he's back. <laughs> Sorry, I yeah, I use a quick command <laughs> that time. Okay. <laughs> Let's see how we can run it. Okay. Yeah, so this is the data matrix and this uh, that's you. You no longer share the screen. Oh, sorry. Can I see my screen? Yeah, now, okay. Okay, so let me run the code a better. Uh, let's see. Okay, so this is a data matrix. You can see that each row is a gene and each column is a cell. 
So this is a normalized data, means that that is normalized by the, for example, the log transformation. And uh, this is the metadata. Metadata contains the information of the, of the serial groups. For example, you can see that this is the barcode and uh, you must have a column called the label. This is the serial group information that we will use to infer the cell communication. And uh, yes, so this is only two input, one is the data matrix, another cell group information. And then you can very easy to create a, a cell chat object here. Yeah, we, so using the cell chat object, the next step is that uh, we should uh, set up the vegan reset database. So if you use a human data set, this is called the cell chat dot human. And if you use a mouse data set, it's called the cell chat dot mouse. And you can uh, you can use this data, data, data uh, base and uh, this is just show the show the database. So this gave an overview of our database. And here I just select the secret pseudonym because here you see that there are different categories. And uh, then we can uh, assign this uh, the database we select to the object. And then the next step is that this subset data is just used to uh, get a portion of the signal uh, to save the memory when you run the data. Uh, so let's just run this step. And this step, and if I the old expiring genes, this is our first step in, I just talk about is any if the differential expiry genes. And we can also any if the uh, differential expression interactions because we want to infer the sensor communications for uh, uh, specific sensor communications uh, for particular, for some cell groups. Yeah. And uh, the core function is this one. This allows you to infer the sensor communications. So just one command, and this takes about uh, 30 seconds. Uh, yeah, this is this is the progression bar that can allow you to see the uh, progress of this function uh, of this running. And uh, okay, so this is the command that can allow you to look at the uh, such communication in a table. So this is a data frame. So you can see the source and target and the communication probability. So this command is the infer the such communication over the at a signal pathway level. So we can also counter other information. For example, this is the number of interactions and let's see, uh, give a real view. So this is the, the width of the link represents the number of interactions between two cell groups. And we can also see the cell communication for uh, each uh, for each cell groups. And uh, let's give an example to see a specific pathway. For example, this is CXCL pathway. We first use a hierarchy plot. So you see this one, and you can also use a, a use a circle plot here, as well as the color diagram and. Uh, Called the theorem and also the heat map. I will not show here. I can just show, okay. The heat map and uh, yes, you can also see the, this is a contribution analysis here because here there is only one ligand receptor that contributes a signal. So this is, you only see a one bar. And we also, you, you can also save all the part using this uh, for loop. And uh, this is the bar part that can show the communication from for example, they show the, all the communication from the cell group A to all other cell groups. And uh, yes, so you can also plot a gene expression to check the expression level. And uh, okay. Yeah, there are some other analysis I will not go detail here. And, and, uh, and in, once you finish all the analysis, you can save this as the object for your future uh, reporting. And in next one, two minutes, I will quickly to show 
how we can use cell chat to perform a comparison analysis. So here, basically, you first need to analyze each data set using cell chat. So first, you have, for example, here we, uh, uh, so here we load the load the cell chat object that are already analyzed for a normal sample. This is for a disease sample. And then we can simply to merge these two cell chat objects using the merge cell chat function. So now you have a merged function. This is called the merged cell chat object. So in a total, there are about uh, uh, 7,000 cells. And then we can compare the intentions between the normal sample and the disease sample. And that we can also show the differential intentions. The difference you know, here, the red line represents the increase the signaling, increase the intention, and the uh, blue represents the decrease the intention. So you can, if you have more groups, you can also use the, our the heat map. So you can see the, uh, the, the increase or decrease the intention between different cell groups. And uh, this is uh, another plot to show to compare the major sources and the target in a 2D space. So for example, here the axis represents the outgoing signaling and the y-axis represents the incoming signaling. You can see that, for example, this one, the inflammatory dendritic cells become the major signal sources and target compared to the normal sample. And uh, yes, so you can also have, this is a manifold learning I just showed in the slides. And uh, yeah, you can see that we can project the signal pathway into a two dimensional, dimensional space for the two data sets. And uh, this one is uh, this one allow you to show that, for example, here show that the, the red signal pathway represents that they only appear in the normal sample, and the green signal pathway represents that they are, they are specific to the disease sample. And the, the black one means that they have an equal contribution uh, between the two data sets. And uh, okay, I think, uh, yeah, we finish this one. So this is just a specific pathway you can show also compare the screen pathway between one data set and another data set. So once you finish all the analysis, and then you can save this as an object. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, both for for the presentations. Um, they were very enlightening. Um, it is really interesting to see like all the mathematics and the models behind. And it was very uh, enlightening to see how we can make the best use of the data we already have through these uh, mathematical models and like to get a look at cell chat and of course. Uh, this uh, very hands-on tutorial. I hope our students have been have been paying attention because <laughs> they'll be using it. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, we're a little bit tight on time, but we're going to take some uh, extra time for the questions. Um, so, if you could stop sharing for now, uh, Suchin. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so the first question is from an anonymous attendee, uh, and is uh, how do you choose the genes of interest to find the transition cells? Are they chosen markers by the researcher, or do you have any model to choose statistically relevant markers? Yeah, we we don't need to pre-select um, the method figured out, right? Now, of course, we 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 needed to do something like. Uh, to looking at the top 5,000 uh, most variable genes. Okay, that's the only start, that, that's the only thing. After that, the, the, the method will tell you what are the genes uh, of your interest, what are the genes who changes a lot during the transitions. And uh, yeah. So one thing I want to point out that, that is, People tend to, people has a clear idea of what a marker gene is, right? Means a gene which highly uh, expressed, specifically mark one particular state of cells, okay? 
Hmm. Now, the most the marker gene might not be the most important gene in the transition. Okay, people tend to think, well, if 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 the basic says if the epithelial genes marks epithelians, then epithelial gene must be more most important to to know. The epithelial genes could be passive, driven by other genes, which is not the marker genes for the epithelium to drive the transitions. So you have to distinguish the genes drive, potentially drive the transition and the marker genes of the individual cell state we are familiar with. That is, that is a ver uh, very interesting. Yes, it does make sense. And it ties up with, uh, with what you've shown with the three-dimensional, like maybe like one gene that uh, uh, the gene expression is high while in transition, but then, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so the next question is, uh, is there any way to associate cell trajectory with the probability of a pair of cells to interact? Yeah, that's a very good question. We, ha we are working on it, you know, of course, you, you, I, I see a couple of questions along this line means to link a transition with the cell-cell communication. That's a very interesting point. And uh, I don't think anybody has done it. And uh, we are working on it in, you know, so it's very interesting. <laughs> oh, that, is, that is great. Um, so our next question does actually have a name. <laughs> the next uh, question is from Juan Manuel Matiz Gonzalez. Uh, great presentation. What do you think about integrating, integrating single cell proteomic data into single cell AI analysis? Perhaps a broader multiomic analysis of cell clusters could be a thing. Yes, in, in principle, the, this technology can be used. Now, uh, what are the special properties of a protein information? What uh, um, you, you, we have to do it in order to actually to see if it works well. But the method in, in principle can be just use it, you know? but it's doing well or not, we have never tried it. Hmm. Okay. Uh, thanks. So the next question um, is from Benjamin Pizarro. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the use of deep learning and it, its interpretability in RNA-seq analysis? Yes, the, the, the particular deep learning method that we use, okay, is to use Bach. Basically, is you use whatever data you have, right? For example, a lot of cases you have the Bach data, chip seq data, Bach chip seq data to build a model, which is deep learning model. And then you replace some of the data you are available, for example, single cell RNA seq data or single cell ATAX data, but you don't have single cell chip seq data, right? And then you say, okay, can I replace that? And then to make, uh, to put in the model. Now, the question is, what's the model for? The deep learning model for our case is we compute the probability of a binding of a particular transcription uh, uh, tr 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 transcriptional factors on certain binding site. Then we say, okay, we're gonna use say, we, we will figure out the probability, which is the likelihood, how likely certain, you, you, you give one to bind at a certain site based on the single cell uh, uh, ATAX data, basically says, well, I can potentially distinguish uh, a group of cells. You know, in order to be more accurate, you might you might need a group of cells, small group of cells. How that uh, kind of transcription binding will be different from, a, from another group of cells, which you cannot derive using traditional bulk approach. Hmm. Right? Ideally, you would have, if you have everything single cell, you, you might be able to get get it directly. Hmm. Yeah, that, it does make sense, and so. Uh, so I think it ties a little bit with the next question, uh, which is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, can you talk a, a little bit about uh, more about SCMC? Has it been tested with datasets with different technologies, for example, 10x and SMASIC2? Yeah, that's a very good question. I don't think so, Sujin, right? We haven't tried SCMC on two different technologies, but uh, the uh, method can be definitely use it. it can be, you, can, you, you can do whatever data set to put in, right? So it's good or bad, uh, we need to test. Sujin, am I right? Yeah, actually there is the uh, one big data, the benchmarking data set we use, they uh, contain the data set from different technology and uh, also data set from uh, different uh, 
patient or owner that is a wine company. Okay, that, so we, uh, yeah. Okay, is it in the paper or is something we did later? Uh, in the paper, yeah, actually we have one. Okay. That's what, yeah. Just, just one data set. Okay. Okay. Nice. Um. So th uh, thank you. So the next question uh, is about cell chat. So when using cell chat with the agonist and antagonist information. Have you measured the effect of including and excluding that information? Some, some ligand receptor interactions could have agonists and antagonists that are not known. Therefore, they will not be included in the analysis because of that. Yeah, that's a, this is a very good question because, for example, for the ligand receptor database, we also manually to curate based on the literature. And this is, uh, uh, so of, of course, there are some interactions uh, or some of them agonists and antagonists that are not known, we are not uh, included in our database, yeah. Uh, uh, but I think that if you have the information that will uh, definitely that will uh, improve the prediction accuracy. But uh, uh, how much accuracy we can improve the, we have that uh, extensive to test data, yeah. Mm. But in, in in principle, you, we can see that in some example, for example, in the TGI beta signaling, because there are a lot of agonists and antagonists, so that may have some effect on the, on the communication strength, but not, uh, uh, yeah, they have some effect on the communication probabilities, yeah. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next question is from uh, Leticia Rojas. Is there any way to quantify the batch effect to define if I need to integrate the data? Or what should I check to choose to integrate the data? Yeah, that's a good question. Now, in, yes, in principle, you can do it, but in, in, uh, we, we don't have one quantity in the code to say, oh, please integrate the data. On the other hand, if you do it, you will find that there are certain metrics you can look at it the numbers, we showed 16 of them. No, we did not invent them, okay? Other people invented the 16. When you're looking at it, you say, wow, we need it. Now, usually it's the following law. If you, for example, if you're looking at the patient's data, clearly the variability is big, you basically you have to use it for, for the human patient, right? Yeah. And if you don't use it, it's very hard for you to compare. So basically the rule of thumb is, if you found something it's really hard to compare, Say, oh, I use Serral to do one data set. I use the Serral to do another data set. Then I put in the picture side by side and looking at it. If, you, if you're looking at it, you can easily get the information you need. Potentially, you, you don't need to integrate. But 99% of the time, the best way to compare the way you, can, you have to put them together to say, oh, but by putting them together, say, oh, that makes sense or not make sense. Or the difference, all the same. So in order to answer that question, you already, did the integration, the question is, now the integration method, my, for some integration method, my smear out the, the true differences, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, most of the method is the opposite is, they tend to over um, uh, emphasize the similarity, than the differences, okay? Rather than other way around. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, yeah, uh, thank you. So the last question uh, for today will be for, uh, from Paulina Garcia. Uh, great presentation, thank you very much. Uh, what type of genes do you consider to model the cell transition? After inferring cell transition, for example, in DC development from hematopoietic precursors, can you determine how another pathway which may or may, or may not be involved in this transition changes? Yeah, that's a good question. You can, in particular for the second part of the, the question is, once you determine the transition path, you just can look at the cells on the trans transition path because you already identify them. And then you're looking at the pathway. And then you can personally just see, you know, this pathway, how much change in the other. Now, the question is, changing might be, might be a consequence of transition, might be the driving force of the, transition, that needs extra work, right? Basically, it's a causality relationship. It's, it's who caused what. It's in, in terms of just finding the changes, that's a straightforward, okay? Hmm. And the first part, we don't need to pick up specific genes uh, to figure out transitions. 
And uh, the, the translation genes is the outcome of the analysis rather than the input. Yeah, that does make a lot of sense. So thank you. Uh, that was the, the last thing, uh, the last question. Uh, thank you very much uh, for being here. Uh, you can stay if you want. <laughs> um, but really, thank you very much uh, for the very wonderful presentations. I am of the opinion that we need more mathematicians on, on the biology field. <laughs> I, I think that it's amazing what you can do with the data if you really look at it. Um, uh, thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to move to our second speaker of the day. So for our second uh, talk, we'll have uh, Dr. Sonia McParland, who is a scientist in the Ahmera uh, Transplant Center and the Schwartz Reisman Liver Research Center at the University Health Network, as well as an assistant professor in the University of Toronto's Department of Laboratory Medicine and Bi Pathobiology and the Department of Immunology. Uh, so Dr. McParland's research uh, program is focused on translating fundamental knowledge about the immune biology of the liver into clinical applications. Uh, Dr. McParlan and her research team are using advanced genomics, including single cell and single nucleus uh, RNA sequencing to describe the microenvironment of the, of the healthy and diseased human liver. Uh, her team is examining how the liver immune environment can be theoretically targeted and manipulated using nanoparticles to slow or reverse ongoing damage. And as you can see already in the screen, uh, she's going to be talking about mapping the human liver microenvironment in health and disease. Uh, many thanks for being here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me. This sounds like a really awesome week of, of lectures and I'm looking forward to the discussions that that this, um, this, this week will lead to. So, Today, I was asked to discuss uh, some of my research and, and my involvement or our work with the Human Cell Atlas Liver Bio Network and how that can apply to cancer research. And as opposed to the, the previous talk, I'm going to talk a lot about experimental design and, and a review of, of how we set up these single cell experiments and manage um, human and animal tissue and, and also how we're using single cell transcriptomics to open up new models of cancer development. Great, so I'm a scientist in a tra the transplant program at Toronto General Hospital. And what I'm really interested in in my lab um, as an immunologist is understanding the building blocks of the healthy human liver and how these repeating units, which are very well conserved in a healthy liver, are dysregulated within in, in liver disease. And really what we want to understand is not only how the parenchymal cells, such as the hepatocytes, the endothelial cells, and the cholangiocytes are behaving, but also what cells are being recruited in and out of the liver and how might this impact the development of disease and more importantly, how can we target this? So what we're looking very closely at are our tissue resident cells that are either sitting in the sinusoid or being recruited into the tissue. And so as I mentioned, we're not alone in this. We're part of uh, the, the, the Human Cell Atlas liver networks. This is funded by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. So it's a, it's a really neat group of researchers that are all kind of working together um, towards the common goal of mapping human liver diversity over a lifespan. So here, here is our group in Toronto, that's Gary Bader, Ian McGilvery, and May Zhang, and Will, um, and, and these are the other researchers, and I'll show you kind of where they're all from um, in the upcoming slides. So what we're doing as part of this group is mapping human liver diversity over a lifespan. So we're looking at mapping fetal, pediatric, and adult liver. And what we're looking at doing is we're looking at optimizing and characterizing and, and really well documenting the tissue collection, the sample processing and the profiling. And today I'm going to talk a lot about the tissue, the tissue collection, the sample processing, and how we um, functionally validate some of these cells. Whereas I, I um, 
Tallulah Andrews would have presented on, on Monday, more of the bioinformatics. One thing I really wanted to highlight for the trainees in the group that are on this call is that uh, within our Human Cell Atlas bio network, it's a really great uh, collaborative group for the supervisors, but it's also a very strong resource for the trainees. And certainly, so what happens within this network is the supervisors meet monthly and they discuss uh, current research, what their work in, prog their work in progress, um, but the students also break out into three groups, a tissue processing group, a spatial transcriptomics group, and a computational biology group. And they workshop through their data uh, with their peers, um, all working on single cell and liver uh, on a monthly basis. So th th these group meetings, uh, monthly meetings are open to anyone. So you can contact us and um, you can certainly join these meetings. So it's a really good resource for, for the students. And these are student led, uh, trainee, PhD student and postdoc led working groups. So what I wanna talk about is the experimental design and how we kind of went, apart, uh, went about asking a very simple question um, in, in 2018. And that was, what is the cellular makeup of a healthy human liver? So the objectives were very simple to create a comprehensive cellular map of the human liver. And we wanted this to provide a foundation for single cell liver disease studies. And so this work that I'm showing is a collaboration between my lab. And so I have a, a cellular biology, a liver immunology lab. This is Ian McGilvery's lab. He's a, a surgeon scientist and he works, uh, he works with models of, sorry, um, Sorry, he's, he's a surgeon scientist and he has various models of liver disease and surgical interventions. And this is Gary Bader. He's a computational biologist, which I'm sure um, is, is no stranger to anyone in this room. So when we were setting up to, to start these experiments, we had had quite a few years of frustration with liver research, trying to culture hepatocytes and trying to uh, find ways to either promote their regeneration or to maintain them in culture. And what we found was that as soon as you start to dissociate a hepatocyte, those hepatocytes fall apart. So we really wanted to be able to capture a map that was as inclusive as possible so that we could understand networks of cells and how the immune cells interact with the parenchymal cells to maintain a homeostatic environment in the liver. So that really guided our acquisition approach in which we took tissue and this human tissue was made available to us um, as surgical discarded tissue during the transplant procedure. And what we did is we took that tissue and we cannulated it with its own vasculature. We did this so that we could rinse out any blood cells within the tissue itself. So we could look at intrahepatic cells. And we also did this so then we could perfuse very gently introduce enzymes into the tissue to break the tight junctions, to disrupt this tissue, but to remove the need for mechanical dissociation. And the aim was to keep these hepatic fragile cells intact. So then we opened the, the mesenchymal layer, we flipped that tissue and released the cells. So what that did was, uh, and we did this all under um, 37 degrees, and we also oxygenated the, the buffers. And, but what we did, which was different um, than, than what conventionally happens is we didn't remove any of the dead cells. We didn't enrich for, for example, um, the cells that were not picking up um, live dead stain or use a bead-based approach to enrich for live cells. Because what we saw, and I'll show you a little bit later, is every kind of manipulation of these cells led to a drop off of certain cell populations or a, a lack of viability in the cells that we detected. And specifically, cells like hepatocytes um, would drop off from our map. So when we, when we ended up with our total liver homogenate and we profiled these cells using single cell RNA seq using the 10x platform, what we did is we included a all the cells in the homogenate. So we ended up having quite a few dead cells that were had a very high mitochondrial transcript ratio and quite a few cells with low numbers of total UMIs. But we, what we did is in the data analysis, we pre-selected on cells that had high UMI and a low mitochondrial transcript ratio. And so what that did was it gave us the chance to profile whatever is viable without enriching for dissociation resistant cells. 
And so um, what we ended up with was a map of five healthy livers and we saw 8,400, we were able to profile 8,444 cells um, from, from five healthy livers. And what we saw were using this approach, we were able to see multiple populations of hepatocytes. And these hepatocytes had genes that we thought correlated with um, being a zone three or zone a central venous or zone one uh, uh, so up, uh, we're seeing uh, only a slide with you Ian McGilray and Gary Vader I don't know if you are uh, oh like, in the slides and it's not showing it's not moving okay one second mm -hmm. Sorry, is that showing now? Uh, I am seeing a, bl a blank screen. Uh, I don't know if any of the other panelists are seeing anything. Uh, she's sharing screen, but she's she has not selected the actual screen she wanted to share. So it's mm. just like waiting for the screen to be shared. Mm. How's that? Uh, no, we still ha cannot see anything. Okay, one second. Is this sharing now? Mm, no, not yet. Okay. <laughs> okay. One second. Is it sharing now? Uh, it's weird. It says that you have to start the screen sharing, but like it's not showing anything. It's like as uh, Enrique said that it's like waiting for. Mm -hmm. Okay, now now we can see your desktop. <laughs> Fantastic. And now? Yes, we can see Excellent. the slide. Okay. <laughs> so um, apologies for that. Uh, so the the slides that that you missed, the most important point to take from the slides that 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 were frozen was that we we pre-select that we select the cells after in a post hoc analysis so that we preserve the ability or the ability to capture hepatocytes, which we found that as we add additional washing or enrichment steps, we lose hepatocytes. And so 
What we wanted to do though, once we saw these hepatocytes, and please interrupt me if it freezes again, um, I'm, I'm happy to be interrupted, is we wanted to look at whether these hepatocytes that had genes uh, like CYP2E1 and, and ARG1 that look like they had uh, a, a periportal or central venous function, we wanted to look at whether we could correlate them with zonated gene expression patterns that had been previously described in mouse by the Itzkovitz lab in the Weissman. And what we did is we took each of the hepatocyte clusters and we performed gene set variation analysis to examine the divisional labor between these cells. And what we saw was these clusters that had or that appeared to have function that was more uh, periportal uh, also had pathways active such as sterile and cholesterol biosynthesis. And then what we saw in the clusters that looked more central venous, we saw P450 pathway activation and drug metabolism as, as well as hypoxia and Wnt signaling. And so what we wanted to do then um, was use this, this data to uh, then look at other, other cell populations. And what we wanted to also look at is a central, a central population of interest in the liver, the liver resident Kupfer cells or liver resident macrophages. And we wanted to look at these macrophages in particular because if you, in an animal model of, of liver regeneration, if you remove all the hepa macrophages, hepatocytes will not properly regenerate. So they seem to set the tone for homeostasis within the liver. And of all the organs in the body, there are more tissue resident macrophages in the liver than any other solid organ. And so what we found when we looked at the tissue resident uh, macrophages were that there was a clear separation between the inf uh, inflammatory signals and non-inflammatory signals in these macrophages. So these non-inflammatory macrophages that looked more like typical um, Kupfer cells in the liver had high expression of the CD5-like molecule, uh, Marco, VSIG4, and Hemox, which are associated with immunoregulation, whereas in the inflammatory, there was a population of macrophages that were more inflammatory. They were expressing S100, A8, and A9, which is the calprotectin complex, as well as lysozyme and CD74. So it suggested that these populations might have more inflammatory function. And so to validate this, we wanted to look at this using uh, an in vitro experiment. And so what we did is we stimulated macrophages um, with um, lipopolysaccharide, and we wanted to measure the potential, the inflammatory potential of these macrophages. And what we saw was when we stimulated the macrophages with these markers that were different, or um, and and separated the macrophages based on markers that were differentiating the populations in the single cell data, we found the Marco negative cells, which which correspond to the cells that are um, CD or expressing the calprotectin complex and, and lysozyme as well as CD74. We found when we stimulated these cells, they produced more TNF alpha compared to the Marco positive ones that were also expressing genes associated with immunoregulation. So it suggested that these two populations in fact did have different functions in the liver, one as maintaining uh, more of a tolerogenic environment and one that more mediates inflammation within the liver. So it's a very interesting uh, polarity and it's one that we can take advantage of in the case of liver diseases, especially liver diseases like liver cancer in which uh, immunoregulatory macrophages are found to prevail. And what I wanted to share uh, with the students is that as we were setting up these protocols, uh, we posted them on protocols.io. And so they're shared within the human cell as development community. I'm sure you guys have um, lots of familiarity with this, but this is a this was a cool technique for, or a cool um, venue for the students to make comments on the protocols. If things weren't working, you can chat with the, the researchers that, that have posted the protocols and you can just ask questions um, and, and we found that it's a, a pretty good resource for sharing um, both the, the, the protocols and also getting feedback on the protocols. And then I also just wanted to share um, this, this website with, with, um, with everyone, with the students, especially for the more biological science students as opposed to the computational biology students. What we found in our lab is that when we have the single cell data before it goes to the bioinformaticians, we like the biologists to go through with their kind of eye on 
the literature and the I am what they expect kind of in their disease model or in their healthy liver. And so they can go to the bioinformatician and say, you know, which populations they want to do pathway analysis on. And, and so this is a neat link that you can use um, to just look at this data and look at your favorite genes um, in the five liver data set and compare um, expression, look at expression, and then can look at your genes of interest. And this was set up by Brendan in, in, the, in the Bader lab. And uh, yep, so you can, you can select your genes. It's called single cell cluster viz. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a pretty neat tool to make the data very accessible to biologists. So, as we proceeded from that, that first description of our healthy liver samples, we then wanted to talk about how we sample disease because the next kind of challenge we encountered was that these, these caudate lobes are uniquely available to us because of the fact that they are discarded during the transplant procedure. And with this in mind, we can cannulate it with its own vasculature and release these cells very gently. But the question is, what do we do now when we're looking at disease? Um, how do we sample disease? Do we use a core biopsy? Do we use fine needle aspiration biopsy? How do we exclude blood, blood contribution? Where we sample? Do we sample the disease site in the periphery? As well as, you know, do we need to sample multiple lobes? And, and certainly a, a question was when to sample. So this is one of our approaches to answer one of these questions. And I'll show you with um, additional data a little bit later is one of the things that we're doing just to pilot the actual contribution of blood to biopsy tissues, either a core biopsy or a flushed wedge biopsy from liver is to uh, at simultaneously sequence blood at the same time. And then we gate out any shared signatures and analyze those separately from the, the signatures that have no blood contribution. So in orange, you see the cell signatures from the PBMCs. In green, you see the cell signatures from core biopsies. And then in purple, you see um, the cell signatures from flood, flushed wedge biopsies. And what we see from this information is that when you look at flushed tissue, um, as opposed to the, the PBMCs or even what comes out of the flush, you see there are certain tissue resident uh, immune cells, especially that are, are kind of very well held in the tissue and just flushing with PBS like you would for a transplant doesn't really remove them. But what we found as we tried to enrich for different populations was that sample processing really affected cell output. And in particular, when we fractionated or tried to spin down cells, what we found was we lost a lot of the parenchymal cell population. So what, what happens was, what we found was, the more we manipulated the, the cells to enrich for live cells, the more we found that we had mostly immune cells at the end and some very um, hard, hearty um, endothelial cells but for the most part, we ended up enriching for immune cells, T cells, B cells, and, and, and macrophages. And um, also we've done this, so the previous experiment I showed you where we matched blood with tissue was in, um, was, was in pig. This is human biopsies, so we're also doing this in human biopsies. Again, we see that there are some populations that are found um, both, and so what you see in purple uh, is, is blood and, and also in green is blood. So these, these clusters right here. And then what you see in red, yellow, green, and blue, these are biopsy samples. So what we can do is if, if we have to biopsy a patient, we can use a blood, uh, a kind of a unified blood signature and, and maybe not remove them from the analysis, but an, analyze the cells differently. Um, so what we're doing uh, now is we're, we're interested in examining disease, but also understanding normal variability in the liver. And as Tallulah mentioned um, in her talk on Monday, we're looking at age and sex and how that affects the cell populations in the liver. We're also looking at how medical confounders, time on life support and cause of death influence single cell RNA sequencing results from liver caudates. And we're trying to figure out how to correct for these confounders in our populations. But one of the ways we're also really expanding our understanding, because as you remember from the first liver map, we ascribed zonation using uh, the, the mouse data set from uh, the Itzkovitz group, from the Halpern paper. 
um, in 2017. And so what we're carrying out as well is human uh, liver spatial transcriptomics. And so that really gives us an, the opportunity to look at, spatial, uh, at, at geographical differences in the immune cells and the parenchymal cells within the, the liver lobule. And just some of the some of the um, growing pains of, of adapting this technology is really in the slicing of the tissue and the preserving of the tissue. So ideally for spatial transcriptomics, um, for it, the tissue isn't folded and the, the samples are embedded in OCT, but we've also taken tissue out of liquid nitrogen and embedded it in OCT as a snap frozen, um, as a, as a snap frozen piece of tissue when we've been able to get nice, nice um, spatial transcriptomics patterns out of it. And so this is just an example of the spatial transcriptomic um, platform and, and how these tissues look. And if you look at our schematic of the lobula, you see these central veins that radiate out and there, here's the portal triad um, with the hepatic artery, the bile duct, the hepatic vein, the portal vein, the hepatic artery and the bile duct. And, and here you see they form kind of um, hexagonal patterns. And what you see using spatial transcriptomics is that there are patterns that are related or that are linked to this periportal to central, periportal to central venous uh, distribution of hepatocytes. And so we're using this platform along with single cell RNA sequencing to examine disease. But one of the things we have to think about when we're setting up experiments for examining disease is the different uh, heterogeneity in disease in the liver. So for example, we want to look at um, sampling different regions of the liver, but the most important thing is that histology always be matched to the single cell profiles. For example, um, in, in, in autoimmune liver disease, such as primary sclerosis and cholangitis, you have a lot of patchy pathology. So you can actually biopsy a patient who has all the markers of having primary sclerosis and cholangitis, and you don't pick that up in the biopsy. So what we, what we aim to do, or what we're trying to do is we sample multiple regions of the liver and we collect tissue for histology, we snap freeze tissue for nu single nuke RNA seq or nu nuclei extraction for um, nu nuke seq, as well as we dissociate tissue cells for flow cytometry and embed tissue for spatial transcriptomics. And then, in terms of our, our HCC patients, um, again, we're looking at, uh, we're taking a, uh, a particular look at the heterogeneity of disease. So, we're looking at tumor we're looking at adjacent and we're looking at normal uninvolved tissue. And so again, we link every, uh, all the single cell profiles to immunohistochemistry. We're looking by flow cytometry at the, at the, at the this cytokine secretion of these cells as well as their surface markers. And we use these cells for in vitro functional assays as well as looking um, at their single cell profiles. And what we're finding is that, um, and this is work done by Jueria Atif, uh, as well as with Tallulah Andrews. And what she's finding is when she looks at healthy adjacent tissue, healthy tissue, normal tissue compared to PBMCs and tumor, is that this data, and this is from 12 patients, can be integrated together um, quite nicely. And, but even as she integrates this data together, she is finding disease specific hepatocyte and, and immune clusters, which she's now testing um, using, or she will test using uh, different in vitro assays. So some of the challenges we're encountering um, as we look at disease, particularly any liver disease that has a lot of fibrosis is that um, the disease tissue can be very hard to dissociate to a single cell level and uh, because it's fibrotic. And it's the same reason why we had very few stellate cells and cholangiocytes in the original map. Those cells are more difficult to dissociate. And so, but if you dissociate deeply enough to release those cells, then hepatocytes can be damaged. So it's kind of finding a balance between being very gentle to the hepatocytes, but also releasing the, the kind of tightly bound cholangiocytes and hepatic stellate cells. And this was something that was a challenge for um, people throughout the network. So we worked collaboratively with the Broad, uh, with Gary Bader's lab, with Ian McGilvery's lab, 
And what we wanted to do was look at single cell versus single nucleus RNA-seq for healthy human liver. And um, I think that uh, Tallulah would have touched on the computational biology, but what was interesting about the, the approach is that there were multiple buffers that were employed to extract the nuclei from the, the, the tissue. And what we saw was that when we compared our liver dissociation workflow, our fresh liver dissociation workflow to the nuclei extraction, what we found was that as opposed to the protocol for tissue dissociation when we cannulate that tissue, and, and I think actually the movie was what, what, what maybe froze, um, what we do is we cannulate the tissue and then generally introduce the enzymes to the tissue and so that releases the cells. What, what we found as we profiled different livers is that if the tissue didn't turn yellow right away and it didn't look like it was a very complete perfusion, all of a sudden you got more immune cells in your liver compared to uh, a, ni a nice caudate where you would see uh, autumn, a very quick change from red to yellow and clearly it was very nice perfusion. And so what we said was you couldn't really comment on the frequency of populations because frequency was so tightly linked to the dissociation protocol. But what we saw um, in this study when we use the protocol, and this is a protocol that's detailed in the Sliper et al. paper, the toolbox for um, single cell and single nuke in nature medicine, using the CST, NST, and TST buffers. And it's a very simple workflow in which you chop for 10 minutes, add the, the detergents, and then do a spin with slow break. What we found um, or what we asked was which, which populations are better at capturing each technology and how well are hepatocytes captured by each technology. What we found was actually that hepatocytes, endothelial cells, stellate cells, and cholangiocytes were better captured by single nucleus RNA sequencing and that the map itself was more representative of, uh, of what we would expect in the liver. Um, and so for the last, say, five minutes, I just want to talk about our efforts to use transcriptomics to open up animal models of liver cancer. So right now we have uh, access to very high quality human liver tissue, but it's impossible for us to study the longitudinal development of liver disease. And so we really want to look at a very uh, focused question based on our understanding of liver biology. And we want to understand, can we selectively target and repolarize macrophages within the tumor microenvironment in hepatocyte or carcinoma in a manner that pro promotes host anti-tumor immunity? And so what we're using is a very, very useful model of, um, of liver disease, but a model that really has definitely benefited from the present or the, 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 the ability to profile the immune microenvironment in the liver by single cell RNA-seq. So the woodchuck is an excellent model to track and target the development of liver cancer. Uh, the challenge though, and, and the reason that it's such a great model to study the development of cancer is that these, these animals are infected with, they're naturally actually infected with a virus called woodchuck hepatitis virus, very much, very similar in genome to hepatitis B virus. And so these animals within two years of becoming chronically infected will develop hepatocellular carcinoma. And that's on an intact immunological background. They have spontaneous tumor development. And of course it closely re recapitulates hepatitis B infection. And so, um, we're interested in this model, even though it's a little bit cumbersome, because as opposed to genetically engineered uh, mo or models of HCC development, chemically induced or xenograft models, they, this, they don't fully recapitulate or closely mimic the development of human disease. So what we've done in collaboration with Memorial University and the surgeons there is that we, we monitor woodchucks for the development of HCC. And what we want to know is, can we target macrophages within the HCC microenvironment to, to reprogram them uh, to promote host anti-tumor immunity? And this is us shipping uh, the woodchuck livers on, on peas. And so we're using nanoparticles to do this. And the reason that we use nanoparticles to do this is they're very modifiable, they're very versatile. So they can carry a payload, 
but they can also be immunogenic or um, they can reprogram cells just by the, their, their content or what they're, they're made of. Um, but they can also be, uh, there can be oligos attached to it, they can carry a payload and they can, they can deliver such a payload. And so, and the most important thing is that nanoparticles are avidly taken up by liver resident macrophages. And what we've seen is that liver nanoparticle uptake in the liver depends on macrophage polarization in the liver. So if we look at a more monocytic cell, so this would be a monocyte in the blood compared to a more uh, immunoregulatory cell, when this is a in vitro derived macrophage that would express a lot of scavenger receptor and would be more like the macrophages that were Marco positive in our map, and um, we see that these macrophages that are Marco positive, um, that are uh, immunoregulatory, take up quite a bit or significantly more nanoparticles than more inflammatory macrophages, which is very interesting in the context of hepatocellular carcinoma because of the fact that macrophages in hepatocellular carcinoma that kind of line the tumor uh, are, have been found to be more immunoregulatory. So in this study, we're collecting or we're injecting nanoparticles into woodchucks that have developed cancer and we harvest organs 12 hours later and look and track the uptake of nanoparticles in macrophages near the tumor using mass spec, focal microscopy, flow cytometry and immunohistochemistry. And what we can see here is that as we scan through the, the macrophages that we've sorted, you see actually in the center, there are nanoparticles um, that you can see in their red dots in the center. So you can see, um, just let it go again. So this is DAPI, this is uh, actin, and then what you see in the center are nanoparticles that are bound with Alexa floor or um, AF740 or 647. And what we also see by, by microscopy is these nanoparticles accumulate in the liver of, of woodchucks that are carrying tumors and are also challenged with nanoparticles. And what we also find is that nanoparticles are preferentially sequestered by macrophages in the woodchuck liver, meaning that these would be a good target uh, for, for reprogramming to promote host anti-tumor immunity. What's interesting is that if we slice through the tumor and we look at uh, closer to the, the uninvolved tissue, compared to the tumor, you see actually there's quite a lot, uh, a very large accumulation of macrophages in that margin between the tumor and the uninvolved tissue, which again is where we're, we're hoping to target with nanoparticles. But what we really wanted to ask, and it was, a, it was a big roadblock in the way, was how do we profile the overall repertoire of cells that take up nanoparticles in order to then evaluate the impact of nanoparticles. So right now we were using nanoparticles that had a fluorescent tag, but they weren't functionalized. So we just wanted to look at uptake. So what we're doing is we're using uh, woodchucks. We're dissociating those livers. So these are woodchucks that have developed tumors. Again, we dissociate the livers after nanoparticle injection. And then we do sort nanoparticle positive cells um, as long as they're uh, as long as they're live cells, and we do single cell analysis, and so this really allows us to look at woodchuck biology in a way that we've never been able to before, because there are very few antibodies that are available for woodchuck, so we're really hampered by the lack of molecular biology tools, um, and so what we see though using single cell RNA seq is that nanoparticles are taken up by several different macrophage populations in the healthy woodchuck liver, um, including endothelial cells, macrophages, plasma cells, myeloid monocytes, and inflammatory macrophages. So it suggests that this would be a, a appropriate avenue for reprogramming macrophages in the woodchuck liver. And what we also, what we also saw was in the HCC bearing liver. So these are woodchucks that are chronically infected with uh, which are hepatitis virus, we also see that nanoparticles are taken up by several different macrophage populations, including inflammatory and immunoregulatory macrophages within the woodchuck liver and endothelial cells. And this was a new finding for us um, that woodchuck endothelial cells take up nanoparticles because previously when we described the rat model for, uh, or we described macro nanoparticle clearance in the rat model of the liver, 
uh, we didn't see or we weren't able to properly visualize endothelial cells as well. But now that we were able to apply um, single cell to the woodchuck liver, we can, we can look very closely at the endothelial cell populations. So in summary, we are able to take nanoparticles, induce tumors in uh, a physiologically or a, a relevant model of hepatitis and, and cancer development or, or hepatitis induced cancer development. And we can track nanoparticle uptake and cell reprogramming in a model that previously is basically inaccessible um, because of the lack of molecular biology reagents. And so ideally what we want to do now is, now that we know that nanoparticles can be targeted to this interface between the tumors and the healthy, the healthy margin, is we want to target those macrophages with nanoparticles that can reprogram the macrophages from an immunoregulatory phenotype to a more pro-inflammatory phenotype. And then we would use single cell um, techniques to then detect whether that in fact then leads to um, more um, active or inflammatory or uh, immune, uh, the, the T cells are more um, pro-inflammatory. So in, in summary, we aim to understand the cellular complexity of the healthy adult and healthy pediatric human liver. We're interested in employing single cell technologies to understand the cellular drivers of liver disease in humans and animal models. And transcriptional profiling will uncover pathways to target and ideally reprogram the livers of patients and, and animals uh, and bring them closer to a map of healthy liver. And then finally, I just really wanna plug um, our, our human liver team. And um, please, if you want to get involved, email us. Um, we have um, monthly meetings. And again, for the students, if, if you want to get involved with the, um, with the student-led team meetings, you're more than welcome to email this, this email address to get involved. And then I'd like to uh, acknowledge the team and the transplant surgeons, the CZI Human Liver Seed Network, our funding agencies, our collaborators um, in the, the human liver seed network, as well as in the Broad, and then all of the surgical fellows that are involved in our research. And I'm happy to answer some questions. Um, many thanks. Um, so it, it was actually really nice to see um, like this presentation and see like uh, the technical challenges and the, like, the experimental design and like how you overcome those technical challenges and see the results. It's really nice and also very surprising to see Woodchuck being used as a model animal. <laughs> um, and the, of course, the approach with nanoparticles, uh, it's always super interesting to, to see new approaches. Um, so we have a couple of questions. Um, so the first one, uh, from an anonymous attendee is, uh, it says, very interesting presentation about all the types of data that you are working with. Have you tried mapping the Visium data with the previously obtained expression data? Is it possible to correlate them? Um, yes, I, I think so. Tallulah would have presented on Monday some of the ways she's annotating the Visium data with um, principal component analysis, but she is using the um, single cell map uh, to enhance or to aid with the, the annotation of, of that data. Okay, thanks. Uh, so the next question is from Tiago Luviana Alves. Uh, thanks, thank you for the talk. The expression changes from periportal to pericentral hepatocytes are really interesting. Are there any clear hepatocyte subtypes by song, or is it more of a continuum? And as a follow up, do other cell type in liver also uh, show this sonation pattern? Yes, yeah, so that's, that's an excellent question. Um, and, and absolutely, um, there are other cell types that, that show this donation pattern, particularly um, what, we, what we saw was macrophages follow a donation pattern. So the Marco positive cells and the Marco negative cells, uh, they, they, the Marco positive cells are closer to um, the, the central vein, the, sorry, the portal vein, the Marco positive cells are closer to the central vein. And then also, and so, the, and, and this is um, n n also expected because 
the blood enters through the portal vein and there would be, it, it's expected that there would be more scavenger receptor bearing cells. One of the questions, uh, and also endothelial cells are very much zonated. CD32B is a really good zonation marker for um, the endothelial cells. One thing we don't know is what happens in disease to that zonation, um, because some of our disease samples, what we're seeing in, for example, transplant rejection, or for example, in primary schools and cholangitis, as well as hepatocellular carcinoma, is our landmarks are usually the bile duct. So anything it stains with cytokeratin 7 or cytokeratin or CK19. Um, and um, those would be our landmarks to say this is, and, and you kind of see that fibrotic area that's more periportal and then a nice clear central vein. When we get into disease, it's very difficult to understand how disease impacts zonation because it's sometimes very difficult to pick up zonation because zonation is very uh, messed up. Um, we also don't know that much about um, immune cells within that zonated area um, because the way to pick out some of those immune cells are through things like um, tetramers and pentamers, and it's, it, it becomes a little bit tricky to pull those out in those tissues. So there's a lot of information about zonation that we haven't picked up yet. One thing we're finding with the Visium spatial transcriptomics um, at, at this point with the 55 micron resolution is that hepatocytes are soaking up a lot of our, our sequencing reads. And so some of the immune populations were not really getting them. So we're very excited about when the resolution for Visium becomes five uh, micrometers, because um, then we think we'll be able to capture more immune cells. Yeah. Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> um, so uh -huh. thank <laughs> thanks for asking this. Uh, so the next question is, is also from Tiago. Yep. Uh, and it ties up to what I said. <laughs> I have never yep. seen research with bootchucks before. <laughs> Very so, interesting. <laughs> so so um, this is a question that, that comes up a lot. The reason that we're so interested in woodchucks is because uh, if you take a tumor clone and you inject it into an animal and your main question is, how does the immune microenvironment set the tone for the development of tumors? And you've put in a clone that's already very well, like it's got all these kind of, it's going to survive no matter what. You can culture these without any media. You can put them in PBS and they grow, right? Um, so, so we really wanted a model that developed spontaneously. Um, within this model, some animals, when you inject them with virus, and this is where it gets tricky, um, as the as Tiago and asked, you have these animals. You would infect, say, ten with Wojcik hepatitis virus. Um, four of them will spontaneously clear the virus and only six will become chronic. Of all the animals that become chronic, they will develop hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, but these are outbred animals. They're, they're, they they um, hibernate uh, and they like to live in little groups. They're, it's almost like having like rabbits or pigs or, or you know, maybe not, maybe not, not monkeys, but they, they require um, quite specific conditions. But, they develop very, they, they develop tumors a lot like humans. Two animals will get the same clone of virus. One will get one tumor, one will get seven tiny tumors. And so that's really interesting. Um, so, so it gives us a really good opportunity to look at number one, the tumor microenvironment, and then number two, the development of HCC. So, you know, what does the tumor, what, what, do, what do the endothelial and hepatocytes look like? you know, just before you see visible tumors. And, and so, but it's, it's a complicated model, but I think it's a very, very powerful model. And uh, they aren't that easy to take care of in the lab. <laughs> yeah, it, it is very interesting. Like you, you always hear about like mouse, monkey, of course, it, but yeah, boot tag. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, so the next question is uh, from Anonymous Attendee, and uh, they're asking if you find big differences in gene expression between frozen and fresh liver tissue, and if there are big if there is a difference, do you do batch correction taking this into account? That's an excellent question. So we haven't done single cell on frozen tissue. Uh, we've only done single cell on fresh tissue at this point. So with our frozen tissue, we only do single nucleus RNA sequencing. 
Um, so it's a difficult question to ask. One thing we do see is that, um, for example, our functional experiments for macrophages, for example, um, with a T cell from the blood, you can freeze them and thaw them and do and do all kinds of in vitro assays. A uh, macrophage from the blood, you can freeze and thaw them and do all kinds of assays. If you freeze down the macrophages from the tumor microenvironment or that have just been harvested from the liver, you can't thaw them and have functional experiments. Like they, they won't secrete cytokines, they won't, you know, phagocytose. So um, for some populations that are really tightly bound in the liver, I think we would lose them. Um, but we haven't done a head-to-head -head comparison of single cell on frozen tissue to single cell on fresh tissue. Hmm. Yeah, okay, so so um, basically what you're saying is that some cell populations may be lost. Hmm. It makes yeah. total sense, right? Yeah, yeah, it would be an interesting experiment to do. It would be interesting to know what you lose. For example, if your whole experiment is centered around T cells, then, you know, it might not be, a, it might not be a problem. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we have a last question. Um, the, uh, from Anonymous Satini again. <laughs> uh, how was the comparison between single cell RNA seq and single nuclei RNA seq able to differentiate the accuracy of liver data since one is, uh, oh, since one is cell based and one is nucleus based, I guess, yeah, this ties up to what we're talking. <laughs> Yeah, so th this is an excellent question. Um, and, and so we, we measured, you know, accuracy by just the capture of populations. For example, uh, the five liver map, which was all single cell, found one population of cholangiocytes. They weren't, there wasn't, you know, um, multiple populations, a very small population of activated hepatic stellate cells. So there are, the comparison was done with a lot of manual markers of hepatocytes, of cholangiocytes, of stellate cells, of, of endothelial cells. So we're still very much in kind of a, a manual mode where, you know, we, we compare some of the, there were definitely some, there were definitely some key marker genes that were shared, but they were not the marker genes that were found in the five liver map. So, but, mm -hmm. uh, the, the comparison of the quality had to do with the number of UMIs detected, the number of pathways that were detected, and then also, you know, the, the sheer number of cells that were, were recovered. And what we found was that the single nuclei, um, one thing that was interesting too is the single nuclei, no matter how, which approach you use to dissociate the nuclei, the map was very similar. Whereas if you use a different approach for any step of a single cell run, for a, a dissociation for single cell, we would see changes in the map. So it was more what the map looked like and how comparable it was. That is very interesting. Um, so I think we're done with the questions and we're actually right on time. <laughs> um, so thank you very much. It was a wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you for taking your time to prepare and like be here and uh, I'm sure the students will have taken like, have learned a lot. <laughs>